a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. And now, the Goldberg. Well, Molly Goldberg was willing to help Mr. Way when the only thing she knew about him was that he was recently released from prison and that he had been a rich man who defrauded thousands of people of their money. All she knew were bad things about Mr. Way, but Molly believes in giving everyone a chance. And so, it was with great pleasure that she heard from an old employee of Way's who told her what a wonderful man Mr. Way had been, how kind, humane, and how thoughtful. It gave Molly reason to believe that Way had merely made a mistake in the past. And so she was willing to forget everything. It makes her feel quite happy now, as she milks the cow and forgets that the people in the town don't feel the way she does. Get over, get over there, get over! Don't cover your tail. Over the tail. have a little more to finish up. <laughs> All right. Finish up. Say, 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 I'm only going to speak English to you, David. Gail, Gail! Open up, Sammy! Here comes Sammy. Here comes Sammy. Oh, baby! Hello, Gail. 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 Well, maybe they're playing a game. Maybe they're playing a game. <laughs> That's good, David. That's good, David. He's a little parrot. He's a little parrot. <laughs> Something I can do to help, Mr. Way? No, thank you. Yes, Ma. Get down, Sporty. Stop jumping. Come on, lay down. 
He's made down spout. He's so jumpy. <laughs> like a little parrot, but he'll learn. Come into the house, David. Are you going in the house? No, no. All right. I'll see you later. See you later. <laughs> there was a dolly mill that lived on the river dee. She worked and sang from morn till night. No one so bright as he, and this the burden of this song forever used to be. I care for nobody, no, not I. <laughs> nobody cares for me. Good evening, Monty. Hello, Frenchman. Oh, he's all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel like in prison, Mr. Wells? What does it feel like in prison? <laughs> <laughs> one, two, one, two. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm going in. One, two, one, two. One, two. Call the doctor. Tomorrow, Rosie. The kid. I wish I knew who it was that said it. <laughs> Rosalind, look at me. Rosalind, Ted Rock. The Ted Rock, Rosalind. Mark, please. How does it feel to be in prison? And right there in front of Mr. Way. I never felt so terrible in my life. <laughs> Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Mr. Wilson, coming in the house. Go up, Rosie. Stop, Rosie. Stop. How do I miss the way to you crying? Go up. Sammy, Jake, not, not by an eyelash. You mustn't know that we know what the children said. Imagine that. You hear me? Go up, Rosie. Go up. Come in, come in, Foxy. Come in, Foxy. Uh, Mr. Ray, uh, uh, finish with the work, Mr. Ray? Yes, for today. Excuse me. Come, come, David. Come, David, I'll, I'll wash your hands. So, so you can have supper. Come, darling. I'll wash your hands. Hands? Yes, you're going to hands. See, darling. See, Sammy, who's on the phone? See, darling. Hello? Yes? Who Just a it? minute, please. Who is it? With from Mr. Way. Mr. Way? Mr. Way. Mr. Way, telephone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Huh? Oh, I see. Very well. I'll be down to make my own selection. Thank you. Uh, we'll have supper soon, Mr. Ray. Thank you. How does it feel like to be in prison, Mr. Way? <laughs> Even a parrot can hurt with his senseless words the way David just did. Mr. Way's face shows no sign, though, and Molly goes on as if nothing had happened. But the fact remains that despite all the good things the Goldbergs have learned about Way, the problem in town remains.
Broadcasting Company presents Plays for Americans by Arch Obler. For these past 20 weeks, the National Broadcasting Company has been bringing you a special series of new plays by Arch Obler, dedicated to men and women of goodwill everywhere who believe in the inherent dignity of all men and who fight together now for a better world for all. Today, we bring you the final broadcast of the special series. The star, Miss Betty Davis. The play, Adolf and Miss Runyon. The scene, an automobile headed from New York toward New England on the Boston Post Road. There's one person in the car, Mary Runyon. And as she drives, her hands are tight on the steering wheel, and her lips are moving. She's not talking to anyone in the car. She's quite alone. She's saying the things that she'd been unable to say just a short while before when she'd seen her husband off on a train. A train taking him away to an army camp. Listen to Mary Runyon. There was a young lady from Maine who saw her husband off on a train. And then she drove home and vowed not to roam until the war and her husband... Until the war and her husband... Oh, Michael. Michael, it's no use. I know I promised, but I tell you it's no use. Twenty minutes since the train left, and I'm... I'm already crying. <laughs> Oh, Michael. <laughs> All right, Michael. All right, I know what you say, darling. Chin up. Michael, I'm going to keep my chin up so high I'll have to wear my hat on it. And Michael, I'm going to be so lonely. I don't think... No. No, I've got to stop thinking about that. Think about, yes, your uniform. Mike, how will you look in a uniform? Like, like that picture we have of Napoleon? Oh, no, you're much too tall. Like the postman? Oh, Michael, if you don't send me letters every day, I'm going all the way down to Texas and sit on your doorstep. I mean your tent step. I mean... Michael, why did it have to happen? That hit... Mother in heaven, if I only had him here. Why, what's the, the engine? Why, oh, gas. I forgot to buy gas. Oh, Mike, and I told you I, I could take care of myself. Now, take it easy, Jenny. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. It's a nice gas station right up ahead, and you can make it if you just try hard. Nice, Jenny. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Jenny, pay no attention to your engine. Just keep your wheels turning. Just 20 more feet. Ten. Five. Now up the driveway. Nice girl. Jenny, you made it. You're a lady and a scholar... And a darn good automobile. Did you say something, ma'am? What? Oh. Oh, no, I was talking to the car. Five gallons regular, please. Five, ma'am? Oh, oh, that's right. I I mean three. Uh, yes. Money, I don't think I have any. Where's my purse? Where, where is it? Oh, oh, here it is. Checkbook. Oh, no, he won't. Oh, whew. Fifty, sixty. Michael... Remember, I was the one who made speeches. How well I could get along without a boss man around the house. And the moment you're gone, I lose... Did you say something, ma'am? No. No, I'm still talking to myself. <laughs> sure. Sure, I, I know how it is, ma'am. I do lots of talking to myself these days. Uh, that'll be uh, 60 cents even, ma'am. Yes, here you are. Uh, thank you. Why do you say you talk to yourself these days? Well, you see, ma'am... 
for the last couple of years, I've had a helper here at the station, and and for the last couple of weeks, I haven't had him anymore. He went and joined the Navy. Ah. Oh. Even though Joe ain't here, <laughs> I, I kind of keep talking to him as if he was here. Yes, I know. Uh, ma'am? Nothing. Uh, do you mind wiping off the windshield while I see if the engine starts? Oh, oh sure, sure. I keep talking, and I don't mind my business. <laughs> Jenny, be a lady. Thank you, Jenny. All set, ma'am. Thank you. It's getting dark. I better turn the lights. Michael, you'll be having your dinner on the train. On our honeymoon, remember we... No, no, no. I've got to stop feeling so darn sorry for myself. You're doing what you want to do, Michael, and I'll do what you want me to. Tomorrow morning, school again. Children, on this, my very first day as your teacher, I'm going to tell you a few simple truths. This geography book I'm going to teach you out of is a fraud. It's as out of date as your Aunt Minnie's bustle. It's... Get out of the road, you crazy hitchhiker, you! Go ahead, wave at me. I wouldn't pick you up, not even if... Oh. Oh, uniform. Come ahead, soldier. Got to be good to the army now, haven't I, Michael? Oh, my person. You saw me, sir. Why don't you leave me all right, all right, so just stop the double talk and get in. Mm-hmm. Where to, soldier? I said, where to? Look, soldier, I'm talking to you and I... Sprechen Sie Deutsch. It... Oh, no, it can't be. Sprechen Sie Deutsch. Oh, no. Warum bleiben Sie nicht stehen? Ich befehle Ihnen weiter zu fahren. Du dummes Weib. Haben Sie mich nicht gehört? Ich habe Ihnen befohlen, weiter zu fahren. Oh, dear, you actually had me going for a few minutes. That phony little moustache and that phony German you're speaking. Why, believe it or not, for a minute I actually thought you were Hitler. Hi, Hitler. Hi, you, mister. That's a terrific act you put on. <laughs> now, tell me where you want to go and what's it all about. Sprich Deutsch, sprich Deutsch, sprich Deutsch. Soldier, I've already told you I appreciate the gag, but enough's enough. Fräulein, do you not speak German? No, I do not speak German. Why don't you drop that phony accent? English. Are you English? Only on my great-grandmother's side. What are you doing here? Answer me. Look here, don't you use that tone of voice to me. I don't like it. Answer me up! Dear God. What are you doing here? What can't be. What cannot be? Answer me! You... You are him. My... English, I do not uh, know what you are saying. You are Hitler. I hit them. I am either dreaming or crazy. Crazy? You are crazy. I know that word. You are crazy. An English woman here, you are crazy. Why have you come here? No matter. To Berchtesgarten. Drive me back to Berchtesgarten. Berchtesgarten. The God of mine. What I do with them. My elite guard, my own elite guard. Every man will be shot. I'm walking along the path. Sudden dizziness in my head. I close my eyes, I open my eyes. I'm on a strange road. And my guard? Gone. Gone where? Shot, shot. Every one of them will be I shot. I wish to God that Hitler was here. And now he is. I know it is a plot against me. Himmler, too. He will be shot. All of them. All of them. Faster. Drive me faster. 
drive you where? To Mainland, I in Bergstadtgarten. I told you, Bergstadtgarten. You don't know where you are, do you? Do not ask me questions to Bergstadtgarten. I'm afraid I uh, can't drive you there. What? I can't drive you there. What is your name? Answer me. Mary Runyon. Mary? That is verboten. Garten? In the army. So? Here's a plot. One of my guardsmen is a Englander in wife, huh? Oh, no, you don't. Back, turn, back, back, or I shoot. It won't do any good to shove that gun against me. Back. For the last time, I order you to turn back. It wouldn't do any good to turn back. I cannot drive a motor car. You must drive me. I... What were the words you say? I said it wouldn't do any good to turn back. Throw it. Throw it. I don't know what that means, but there's no turning back. You are not where you think you are. Stop saying that. Where am I? America. America. <laughs> and why am I in America, crazy one? Because I wish to God I had you here. And somehow Do God... Advance. Advance. Ich bin der Führer. Ich bin der Führer. Der Führer, der Führer, der Führer, der Führer, der Führer. I don't know what you said, but it doesn't make any difference. God did it, and you're in America. I'll prove it to you. I'll stop and show you. No, no, do not stop. Well, I'll prove it to you anyway. Turn on the spotlight and look at that sign. What is sign? Advertisement alongside of the road. There, we're passing it. You seem to know English. Can't you read? The word? I do not know. Uh, all right. You will keep driving the motor car ahead. At the next patrol, you will stop. They will take care of you, you crazy Englandine. You still don't believe this isn't Germany. All right, at the crossroads ahead, I'll prove it to you. No, 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 go, 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 Stop go. poking that gun at me. There's the crossroads sign. Look at it. You give orders to me? Look at the sign. Read. Well, New York 55. Bows to... New York. New York. I told you. Look at the car you're driving in. Can't you see it's American? And and look at me. Can't you see I'm an American? It cannot be. No. America? I, the fear, in America? That cannot be. Is that any more impossible than... And the fact that almost all the people of Europe in just a few months have become slaves? And is it any more impossible that, that an ignorant Austrian house painter, you, have become their slaver? Who are you? I told you, Mary Runyon, an American. I just saw my husband off on a train. He's on his way to an army camp. I was so unhappy, I started to think about you and the misery you brought to me, and I cried out to God, and here you are. That's all there seems to be to it. America. America. So it's really happened. A plot. I suppose you've always been afraid of a, a plot against you. But this time, God... God, 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 close your mouth, woman. Hitler, I am Hitler, the chosen one, the fearer, the fear of the world, fear of the new order. When I used to hear you on the radio, I thought you were a very funny little man. I told you to close your mouth. I order it. I don't think you're funny anymore. You've caused too many tears. No. You aren't funny at all, are you? I will have you shot. That's your usual solution, isn't it? A plot. Himmler. Yeah, Himmler. He had me drunk. Brought to America. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Don't you believe you're in America? <laughs> Fools. All of them fools. 
they think they can get rid of me in America. <laughs> you will drive me someplace. I will sit. I will hide. I will wait. And so my army will be here. And I, their Führer, will come forth and confound the enemy. As simple as that. Why do you talk? Listen to me. Plan. Everything is with plan. If I'm in America, so I will wait in America. My army, my Luftwaffe, they will be here. It is in the plan. You will put me someplace where I will be quite safe. I will wait. Will I, really? Well, it will be your honor. In the new order, perhaps there will be a small place for you if it uh, fits the great plan. You aren't frightened at all, are you? Right. Afraid? You simple woman, you. Have you not ears to hear the words I say? What have I to fear? America, South America, Canada? All will be part of my new order. All I must do is wait. It's in my geopolitic bureau's plans. The conquest of the world for the Deutsche Gesellschaft. Nothing has been forgotten. Oh, that's where you're wrong. What? Oh, you have forgotten something, you and your planning bureau. Nothing, nothing has been forgotten. Oh, yes, it has. What? Look, Adolf, they're ahead. What? Those lights, that's a factory working, working all night. That's part of the anger of America. Look at those lights. They are the lights of your doom. Stop it. Do not say that word. Let them work. Let them work day. Let them work night. I tell you, it is too late. Oh, no, it isn't. You, woman, by what right do you disagree? By what right? By every right. Stop. I order you. You stop ordering me and listen. Why? You heard me. Listen. You said we were too late, and I suppose that was part... I suppose that was part of your plan to keep us from doing anything until it was too late. But I tell you, you're wrong. Look at those factories. The men and the women working there, they know they're not too late. All you and your generals and your planning board. One thing, that Americans are people who don't get going until they're angry. And all America is angry I now. Order and you I am to... angry now. A month ago tonight, I was married. You hear that? Marriage. Do you know what marriage means? A man and a woman and a life together. A life together. We're not going to have that life together, Michael and I. Oh, I'm not fooling myself. I know it. We're, we're being cheated out of what everybody's right. Living together and growing together and having children. And, and then why? Why? You and your gangsters. I pray to God that you will hear, and now I pray to God that you will die. You... you will be shot? Huh. So, you are not so brave, huh? I don't realize huh? Yes, that's why he did it. What? Huh? That's why he did it. That's why he put you here. Who is he? God, that's why he did oh, it. Oh, hear the word, your God! What are you saying? What are you thinking? Why is your face? What do you think you are going to do? You're not so brave now. Answer me! I'm going to kill you. What? What did you say? I'm going to kill you. Stop the motor. Stop the motor! No. For oh, Rick, stop the motor! Gun! I shoot you. Stop the motor. For the last time. Wait a minute. Look. Look, Look at what? The speedometer. Huh? Speed. Look at the speed we're going. Uh, stop. You crazy woman. You stop. I will shoot. I swear it. I will shoot. At this speed? Oh, no, you won't. I will shoot you for the last time. All right, I... go ahead. Shoot. Shoot. The steering wheel will go out of my hands and we'll both die. I want you to die. Jesus, slow up the motor. Listen to me, the motor. Slow it up. I order you. No. Don't listen to me. I am ordering you. I, the Fuhrer. You'll be the Fuhrer of the worms. 
Pulling it, pulling you to pieces, my soldier. One more chance. Listen to my order. Stop this car. No. Oh, you are a woman of one mind. Huh? I understand you. Such a woman I can understand. Uh, I, too, have always been of one mind. Have you really? Yeah. To know what one has to do and to do it. You think you must kill me. But even as the whole world, you have a great, uh, what is the word, uh, admiration for me, no? No. The speed is so great. If you could slow down so I could talk to you. And... No. But it's not of myself I'm thinking. It's of you. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, you can believe me on my honor. I'm thinking of your safety. If you would just slow down a little, whatever your plan is to kill me, I do not know. But if you would slow down just a little so that I can explain certain matters to you. I swear that I will take no advantage. I assure you, Fräulein, as a oh, gentleman, stop. and as an officer... Stop it, I tell you. Uh, what? You're wasting your breath. I heard you the first time. When? Just before you march into the sedation land. Oh. Uh. Czechoslovakians, I am thinking of your safety. If you will give me sedation land, I swear to you, I will take no advantage. You can believe me on my honor. Remember? I'm... Those were... Different times. Yes, you were in the driver's seat. Fräulein, a uh, woman, I do not know what your plan is to kill me, but you must slow down. You must listen to me. I told you, you are a woman I can understand and admire, and so I can talk to you and explain. You and I have no quarrel. We must stand shoulder to shoulder against our common enemies. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they persecute us. They want to take away what you have. The long fingers reach to all the nations. I alone stand between them and you. I alone will save you from the first war Bolshevist. Stop. What? I've heard that line before, too. Huh? At Munich. Appease me, brothers, and I'll save you from the menace of the Russians. Oh, don't you remember? Oh, you... You do not understand me. No. Yeah, yeah, that is a difficulty. America does not understand me. I... I am a good, simple man. I think only of the people. You... If you could understand me, you could explain me to America. You could be the hero of all America. Mrs. Quisling? Uh, do not talk. Listen to me. I told you. I admire you. I admire few women. I, I give you great honor. I do not know how you intend to kill me, but if you would slow down and stop the motor, I could work out some great... Uh, how you say advantage to you. Do tell me. Ah, you are a wise woman. I interest you, huh? You could have money. Beautiful houses. Surely. We have only the best. The best that you could see. Woman, will you listen? Why should you kill me? Soon I will no longer be the leader. Why then kill me? What do you say? Oh, it is the truth. Peace is coming. Peace. A glorious peace. And I will step down from my high place to bring this peace. Well, why do you just look ahead? Slow down the car, woman! I know of that peace. Phony peace. Uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh. the phony peace that will come when you and your gangsters think you are beaten. You will go back to Bestesgarten and they will say, Look, we have thrown over Hitler. Peace, it's wonderful. But it won't be wonderful. The minute we believe and put down our gun, you will start a new war, a more terrible one. You won't fool us with your phony peace, Adolf. Believe me. You, you, stop it, stop the motor. My nerves, I cannot endure the speed. Tell me, 
You must tell me where are you driving? What are you going to do to me? Keep on driving straight ahead. And then? A few miles ahead, the road turns to the right. But we won't turn to the right. We'll keep going straight ahead into a concrete wall. A concrete wall. No. No, you won't. You cannot. If I die, you die. You would not do that. I know it. I know it. You would not. You're so positive I won't die to kill you, aren't you? Oh, well, you're wrong. As wrong as you've always been about America and Americans. I'll die to kill you gladly. Any one of us would die to put an end to you. Oh, you'd better start believing that, Adolf Hitler. Because in a few minutes, you're going to die. You're going to die. Nein. Nein. Do believe. No. No, you will not kill me. Ich darf nicht sterben. I am the leader of the world. Ich bin der Herr, der Welt, der Meister, der Führer. Es ist mein Schicksal. It was my destiny. I'm afraid to die. Lieber Gott, I'm afraid to die. Ich fürchte, dein Tod nähert mich nicht. Do not kill me. Do not. Do not. Do not. Michael, listen, I... Michael, I started this trip talking to you as if you were here, and I'm ending it that way. You could hear him, Michael. He's crying. Tears from such a creature aren't the same as tears from other people, are they? I never could stand tears, Michael, could I? But his tears are unclean. Yes, Michael, that's what it is. He's something unclean. Something out of a part of mankind's... Yes, out of a part of mankind's past history. The brutality, the cruelty we thought would never come back into the world. I'm going to kill him, Michael. In just a few seconds more. Kill him and rid the world of him. Oh, I know. I know that killing him won't solve the whole problem, Michael. When he's gone, the symbol of the terrible thing he stands for will be gone. And the blinded people on his side will be frightened. And the people on our side will fight harder and we'll win faster. We'll win faster. And then there'll be a peace, a real peace. And the little people all over the world will make sure this time that it's a peace with wisdom. A peace where everyone in the world has what he needs. And then there'll never be hinders again. Never, never. Michael, listen to him. He's so frightened he can't talk. And I'm frightened too. I see it up ahead. The wall where the road turns. I'm not going to turn my straight ahead. Straight ahead. He's got to die. God wants him to die. Put her down, Jethro. Oh, now the flashlight. Turn it on her face. I want to see. Oh, no. You did, huh? No. Huh? Look, her eyes. She's opening her eyes. No, 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 lady. No, don't try to sit up. No, she shouldn't sit up. Now, quiet. Quiet, everybody. She's trying to say something. What is it, miss? I, uh... I hear... Miss, please, don't, don't, don't try to sit up. You'll hurt, you'll... you'll... No, I, I'm all right. But you can't be. you uh, crash that I'm car. all right, I tell you. Where is he? He? Well, who are you talking the, about? The, the man in the car with me. Where is he? Don't just look at me. Tell me where he is. Lady, I, I don't get it. A crack up like that is... You ain't even scratched. Oh, tell me where he is. Somebody tell me. Where is that man? Lady, there wasn't anybody in the car with you. What? 
I tell you, there wasn't anybody in the car with you. Was there? No, I swear she was alone in the car. Lady, don't look at me like that. I'm telling you I was by your car a minute after you smashed up. I give you my word there was nobody in the car with you. I prayed to God that he was here, and he was. Huh? And then I prayed to God that he was dead. Maybe. Officer. Officer, help me up. Quickly. But, lady, you shouldn't... Quickly, I tell you. I've got to get into town. I've got to see tomorrow morning's newspaper. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard Miss Betty Davis in Adolf and Ms. Runyon. With Miss Davis was Hans Conrad. This is Arch Obler speaking, and the reason I'm talking directly to you this afternoon is that this play with Betty Davis was the final of this special series of wartime plays I've been writing and producing for the National Broadcasting Company these 20 weeks. I want to publicly thank Betty Davis, as well as the many other artists, great and small, who have contributed their efforts in these plays. Plays written for one purpose only, to help you and ourselves understand more clearly the enemy we are fighting against and the peace we are fighting for. To Gordon Jenkins, who has written so many brilliant musical scores, a low bow. And many thanks to Charles Danton's fine orchestra. Thanks, too, to Bob Brook, Frank Bingman, Harry Seth, and the Hollywood Victory Committee. When I originally started to write these plays, I intended to do only eight of them. Because of the wonderful response from you and the radio editors all over the country, we have done 20 consecutive original plays. And so for a while, goodbye and thank you. Plays for American came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. a new series of radio programs, The Clock. There are three provinces in the kingdom of time, the past, the present, and the future. Living in the first, we find a historian, a sober, factual man whose interest lies only in the things that were and whose yesterday is more absorbing than his today. Most of us, however, live in the second province, the present. Our interests lie with the things that are, and we find satisfaction in trying to enjoy each moment as it comes. But there are those who spend their lives in province number three, and these are sometimes called dreamers. There is no past for them and no present, only the future. Avidly, they try to probe its hidden secrets. Tenaciously, they cling to each device, the horoscope, the palm, the crystal ball, and the deck of cards. Childishly, they are unaware of the dangers involved in knowing too much of coming events. Such a woman was Anna Sweet. She married her husband, Alvin, in 1912. Their story begins in that year, when Anna and Alvin Sweet scanned the horizon for future glories, forgetting, perhaps, that the paths of glory lead but to the grave. <laughs> Oh, nonsense. We haven't seen even half the exposition. They've got a model of the horseless carriage on the other end. Elvin, there's a telephone display nearby. Couldn't we come back some other time? Oh, all right. If that's the way you feel about it. Don't be angry with me, Anna. I was hoping to see the telephone. Maybe one day, when we're rich, we'll even have one of our own. 
Oh, it must be wonderful. Well, let's go ahead, man, and we've really seen enough. Mm, you just don't like to have any fun. All you ever want to do is sit home by the fire and read your silly paper. I suppose that's what I get for not marrying a man near to my own age. Haven't you been happy? I suppose so. <laughs> Forget I ever said that, Alvin. I'm sorry. You're probably right. A girl like you could have married someone young and handsome, rich. I often wonder why I was lucky enough to win you. <laughs> or maybe I saw something in your future, Alvin. Maybe the cards told me that one day you'd be a big man. The cards. It's always the cards. You're like a child that way. Don't make fun of me. I don't like it. Oh, forgive me, dear. You're like all the other skeptics. You never see any farther than your nose. I tell you, the cards don't lie. Oh, look. Another ice cream stand. I think I'll have a strawberry this time, Elvin. Another ice cream cone? You have two already. So what's the matter? Can't you afford it? I was just thinking of your figure. You're not the only man who has. Anna, I don't like that kind of talk. Oh, let's go home. Oh, excuse me, please. Yes? Baba is my name. Madam Baba. Would you like to have your fortune told? Not now, thank you. Oh, wait. My name is Baba? My tent is just across the path. I saw you pass a lovely girl and an intelligent man. The cards may have something good in store for both of you. Come on, Anna. Let's get your ice cream cone and go. Oh, eh? Never mind the ice cream. I want Madam Baba to read the cards for you. But that's ridiculous. I don't believe in it. There are many who come to Madam Baba's who don't believe. When they leave, it's different. Well, let's go into her tent, Alvin. But it's just a waste of money, Anna. I, I don't like to have money. Oh, why are you always so hard to get along with? Can't you do this one little thing for me? All oh, right, if you insist. It may bring a change in your life, my friend. An important change. A good change or a bad one, Madam Baba? Only the cards can answer that. <laughs> Sit down, my friend, while I place the cards. I believe in cards, Madam Baba. No, I don't. Alvin. That's quite all right. Each to his own opinion. Now, what do we see? This card is a woman. A beautiful woman. Yes. Well, that might be me. No. No? The woman is not you. Oh, the money card. I see the money card. Yes. And now we'll find out what it brings. Well, what's the matter? The That means death. Let's get out of here. Now, just a moment. You may as well hear the story. It may save you a lot of grief. The death card, madam, is in an uncertain position. You mean it may not come about? That all depends. Your husband must be aware of the color red. Red? It is a dangerous color for you. What about green or pink or orange or magenta? Alvin, stop being funny. If you do not follow this advice, the color red will lead to money. A great deal of money. Well, if that's what you call hard luck, I'm all for it. But listen closely. When you get this money... You must refuse it. Refuse it? It is essential, my friend, that you do. Your life may depend on it. Is that all? Yes, that's all. What else do you advise him to do, Madam Baba? I have told him all I know. But I see he still doesn't believe. I can only repeat what I said before. Your husband must beware of red and refuse this money. Or very soon, you will find yourself in widow's knees. <laughs> You've been staring out that window for over an hour. Come here and sit with me. A headache. I don't feel too well. You want to have a headache, Pat? Oh, powder won't help. It's more mental than anything else. You're still worried about that, well, what that fortune teller said. Well, then I wish you wouldn't take it so lightly. But it's been almost a week now, and I'm still alive. Please don't joke about it. Why not be sensible? Don't you see what nonsense it was? The color red. And all I could do to keep from laughing. <laughs> the fortune is <it's> crazy. <laughs> Uh, maybe Madame Barber was thinking about the sweepstakes. The winners were announced in the papers today. What was the first prize? Fifty thousand. There are no safer ways of making money. <laughs> I saved myself money by not buying a ticket. Elvin. What? That tie you're wearing. This tie? Take it off. Can't you see it? It has red in it. Now. Oh, take it off, I say. Uh, 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 you're choking me. There. I'm throwing it in the fire. Are you crazy? That, that tie... I got... don't care what it costs. It's going to burn. Oh. Anna... Then you must. Do you have? No, 
Oh, no, no, don't act like it. I'm not mean to you. It's something I can't help. I only wish I could give you all the things you want, Dad. Pretty clothes, fancy furs, horse and carriage, fine new house. This place is so small, so old. Maybe one day you will, Alfred. When the fortune teller's prophecy comes true. No. I don't want it that way. I don't want it, do you hear? That's getting late. Let's go to bed. Oh, dear. Yeah. Be at the shop early tomorrow. Mr. Kinney said we're having a sale of celluloid collars. Oh, look. Could that be in, in this way? Well, it's after ten. You better look out of the window before you open the door. It's a woman, Anna. Strange to the skin. What can she want? We'll have to ask her to find out. Don't let her in, Alvin. What? I'm afraid. Of a woman? We can't let her stoke out there in the street. She, she may only want to ask directions. Evening. Good night. Good night, Why, yes. The rain is coming down in streams. My carriage went into a ditch about a mile up the road and my horse ran away. I can't get help tonight, and I don't know where to go. There's a hotel about two miles from here. Oh, I'd never make it. Couldn't I stay with you? What we don't run a boarding house. I know that, but I'm, I'm cold and wet and, and sick besides. I'll pay you for it. I don't want any charity. She's going to faint. No. No, I'm all right. I'm going to collapse. Here's some money. I'll, I'll sleep on the couch if you want me to. Just let me stay. We can't refuse Anna on a night like this. I don't like it, Alvin. But you can have the attic room. She won't disturb us. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're kind. I won't forget it. Uh, do you mind uh, if I ask what your name is? Higgins. Cleo Higgins. But on account of my hair, most people call me Frank. Alan, wake up. What's the matter, Anna? I can't stand it any longer. It's four in the morning. You've got to get rid of her now. Who? That woman. A few hours will be morning and then she'll leave. I won't wait until morning, Alfred. I can't sleep as long as that woman's at my house. Come on, Alvin. You know what's red? Light red. That's blood. Go to sleep, Anna. No. No, I'm getting rid of her. Alvin, our lives may depend on it. I'm telling her to get out of this house right now. Anna, I can't understand you. Why don't you leave that poor woman alone? Be quiet. It's a crime to wake her up only four more hours. Just be quiet, Alvin. You hear anything in her room? No. She must be fast asleep. It's so ill. I'll never go to a hospital. This isn't a nursing home. That fortune teller, that stupid prophecy has made a nervous wreck out of you. Only a fool doesn't take a warning. Get out of my way. I'm going to wake her up. What's the light? The lamp's on the trunk. Here, use these matches. She sleeps well, I notice. So we'll put an end to our dreams. inside Pandora's box. From the point of view of time, this box contains the future, and its secrets are forbidden to us all. But there are always some who ignore the warnings and who refuse to remember that curiosity has often killed more than just a cat. Oh, then what do we do? Now, don't lose your head, Anna. I wish I knew she'd bring trouble. Madam Barbara was right. You should have listened to her. There's nothing to get upset about. As far as I can see, she died of natural causes, probably a heart attack. How do you know? You're not a doctor. My father died that way, and his face was blue like hers, you see. We had a chance to get out of bed and call for help. It went like that. Shall we get the police? Yes. Uh, Looks like she's crutching the hand. I don't know. Let's see if I can close her fingers over. Well, then don't touch the body. Let me take a second. A strip of paper. If she wrote some uh, some kind of message. Hmm. Not so easy to pry her hands open. Oh, how can you even go near her? I got it. Ah. Let me see under the lamp. What is it? 
It looks like Anna. Anna, get me the newspaper downstairs. The newspaper? What for? Don't argue with me, Getta. Do you know what this is, Anna? No. It's a ticket on the sweepstakes. In the name of Lucky Red, and I'm almost sure, Anna, that's the name that was listed for the 50,000 first prize. <laughs> That's all I know, Constable. She asked for a room, and we found her dead about an hour ago. Well, it was just one of those things, I suppose. The coroner said it was a heart attack, all right, although she's kind of young. He said she must have exerted herself too much in the storm last night. But we found her carriage. Oh, did you? In a ditch. Huh? We also found a suitcase there. Now, are there any more of her things here except her clothes? That's all she had, Constable. My wife loaned her the night gown. Nothing else, eh? No. no nothing else. All right, Mr. Sweets. We'll hold the body at the morgue for a day or two and see if we can find a relative. If there's anything more you need me for... No, no, no. The case is closed as far as you're concerned. Good night. Goodbye, Constable. You didn't tell him, Elvin. I didn't tell him what? That there was something else. A sweet steaks ticket. Be quiet, Anna. He may still be near the house. You've got to give that ticket up. Do I look like a moron? Give up 50,000, not me. But it doesn't belong to you, Elvin. No, no. And who does it belong to? The grave? What good will it do it now? These tickets are only registered by the silly names their owners give them. No one will be the wiser. All I have to do is claim the money. I won't be questioned. Who wants the money? Who wants to make a bargain with death? <laughs> You're thinking of that blasted fortune teller again. The prophecies came true, didn't they? First the color red and now the money. You remember what she said? If you keep that money, I'll dress in widow's weeds. And take out and get rid of the ticket before it's too late. No, not in a million years. You can take a prophecy and burn for all I care. All my life I wanted money and so have you. I'm tired of being a worm. I'm going to live like a king. Oh, then you'll regret it. Will I? Hmm. Well, you won't, my darling. Just think of the things I can get. I'll dress you like a queen. I'll quit the rotten job I've had for all these years. I'll buy you diamonds and furs. What do you say to that, Anna? I have nothing to say, Alvin. Don't look at me that way. Think you were seeing a corpse. Maybe I am, Alvin. Maybe I am. Alvin? Oh, don't bother me now, Anna. Alvin, there's a man outside to see you. Ma'am? Who is he? His name is... He didn't look. Is... Is he related to... She was his wife. What did you tell him? I said I'd call you. What? Didn't you say I wasn't home? What do you want him to do? Take, a, take it away from me? You'd better see him, Alvin. All right, all right. You stay here, Anna. I'll talk to him alone. Evening. Good evening. What can I do for you? I'm Cleo's husband. They told me that she died in your home. Yes. She took shelter here for the night and passed away very suddenly. Yes, she had a bad heart. We had an argument and... She walked out on me. I only found out what happened to her this morning. I'm deeply sorry, Mr. Higgins. The police gave me her clothes. Was there anything else? Anything else? Did you find something on the that she might have lost? I believe the police have everything, Mr. Higgins. I'm not so sure. I beg your pardon? Where's her room, Mr. Sweets? She slept in the attic. Do you mind if I have a look around? Not at all. I'll show you the way. The room's completely empty now, of course. Empty? We gave it a thorough cleaning after the accident. We removed all the furniture. The room's quite bare. And there's no point in my scene. Not really. Uh, but would you mind telling me just what it is you're looking for? Oh, it's just a memento, something to remember her by. Something she had on when she left me. Ring or bracelet? Then. No, it wasn't a ring or a bracelet. Let it go, Mr. Sweets. Sorry to disturb you. No trouble at all. If you happen to run across anything that doesn't belong to you, here's my card. I'll remember. Good night, Mr. Sweets. Goodbye, sir. Oh, Anna, I got rid of him. I fooled him completely. Did you, Elvin? The last we'll see him, Mr. Higgins, the idiot. I'm not so sure, Elvin. Come here. What, what is it, Anna? Out of the lamppost across the street. It, it's Higgins. And I have a feeling he's waiting for you. Well, do you think the cards are stacked against Alvin's sleep? Or like him, are you a skeptic? A disbeliever. Let's listen and learn. Is he still there, Anna? No. He's he gone. He didn't move from that spot for five hours. I, I thought we'd never be rid of him. He looked dangerous, Alvin. Well, he's gone now. I guess he's given up. <laughs> don't, don't, don't open that door. Are you frightened, Alvin? No, 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 no. Of course not. Frightened of what? I'll see who it is. 
Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Sweet. Did you find that memento? No. Are you sure? I told you before, didn't I? No. Just thought I'd call to check. I'll get in touch with you again, mister. <coughs> Fifty thousand is a lot of money, Alvin. You won't be too willing to let it go. Why, my wife, you are. You sound as if it's none of your affair. You sound as though he doesn't worry you in the least. I stopped worrying, Alvin. When you did. There's nothing left to do now. Wait. Wait? Wait? Wait for what? The rest of Madame Barber's prophecy. I know. I waste him like a ghost watching the house when he... When I leave, he follows me in the street and... But always with that hand in his pocket. The cards don't lie, Alvin. What do you mean? The cards don't lie. Do you think he plans to kill me? The cards don't lie. Alvin, is that you? Alvin, what are you doing in the cellar? I told you to go away. Ah, there. Finished. Why did you dig that hole? Unless you know the better, Anna. Tell me, Alvin. I've had enough of Mr. Higgins and that prophecy. He's not going to kill me, do you hear? He's not going to get the chance. What are you going to do? I booked our passages, Anna. We'll leave tonight. We'll go abroad. I'll collect the money and we'll be in clover. You haven't told me why you dug that hole. He's here, are you? But who is coming? He's here. He's took me crazy long enough. I'll put an end to it now. And I'll have to be prophecy with him in the grave. Alvin! Alvin! <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Sweet. Good evening. I thought I'd come by to see you once more. Have you had any luck? That all depends, Mr. Higgins, on what you're referring Let's to. Let's put an end to this first, Mr. Sweet, shall we? Anything you say. Give me the sweet stakes, Tigger. The one you found on my wife. Why should I? Because it's mine. I paid for it. My wife ran off with it. I want my ticket back, Mr. Sweet, and I want it now. And if I refuse? I'm a bigger man than you are. I dislike violence in any form, but I'd gladly beat you to a pulp. I'll... Split it with you, Mr. Higgins. That'd be silly. Half for you, half for me as to bargain. Give me that ticket, Mr. Sweet. Did you hear what I said? Take your head from that. All right, that's just a sample. Now, hang it up and hand it over. Very well, you win. The the ticket is on the the mantel over the fireplace. Come with me. Now, I'm asking you once more, Mr. Higgins. Will you share with me? The ticket, Mr. Sweet. Here you are. And here's an added dividend. You killed him. He smashed his skull with a book. He was looking for it, wasn't he? Killed him. No. No, we're rid of him for good, Anna. And the prophecy has been broken. We're free and we're worth a fortune. What a murderer, Alvin. No one will know but you. I'll bury him downstairs and we'll close the house. Why are you staring at me like that? Horrible dream. Well, don't act so high and mighty. You stood there in the hall and watched me do it. Why didn't you open the door and shout for the police? You wanted the money just as much as I did. I didn't protest, Alvin, because I knew it was no use. No matter what we did, the prophecy would have to be fulfilled. Are you coming with me, Anna, or must I leave you behind? I'll go with you, Alvin. Oh, good girl, good girl. I knew you wouldn't fail me, good girl. You're too smart, Anna. So am I. You see how smart I've been, don't you? No one can ever touch us, no one. You'll stay in that cellar as long as we keep this house, and we'll keep it forever. But we're leaving the house, Alvin. You said we were going abroad. Yes, we are, just as soon as I've collected the money. Look, I've got a surprise for you. Look, Anna. Here are our reservations. Nothing's too good for you now, Anna. Look. Royal Suite. Standing from Southampton, April 10th, 1912. Lady Voyage. SS Titanic. The Titanic, Anna. What do you think of that? I'm sure. The Titanic. Time has its way of fulfilling its own prophecies, as Alvin Sweets discovered. As you remember, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank in mid-ocean. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Written by Lawrence Clee and starring Hart McGuire as the clock. You heard Don Crosby as Alvin Sweets. Others in the cast were Myrna Dodd, Sheila Sewell, Ruth Cracknell, Len Teal. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production.
the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Solid Citizen. Worthington Potter was a solid citizen, cultured, able, and above all else, dignified. For dignity was Worthington's keyword. New England dignity, back bay Boston dignity, the right clubs, the proper friends, clothes from Brooks Brothers. For some years, he had acted as financial manager for Althea Kendall, a wealthy Boston widow who thought Worthington was a fine man, wise in the ways of commerce. Unfortunately, she was not entirely correct. Worthington, while long on dignity, was short on financial genius. A regrettable situation, since in his capacity of financial manager, he had occasion to handle large sums of money for Mrs. Kendall. Oddly enough, this is what brought Worthington to Mrs. Kendall's on what was to prove a rather crucial visit. You've been so quiet all afternoon, Mr. Potter. Are you worried about something? I was hoping I could conceal it, Mrs. Kendall. You have a strange power over me. I've been conscious of it always. Strange power? Mrs. Kendall, words are hard to find at a moment like this. Oh, really, Mr. Potter? Quite. Our relationship during the past ten years has been, I trust, as pleasant for you as it has been for me. Well, of course, Mr. Potter. You're a charming woman, Mrs. Kendall. Why, Mr. Potter... I must admit that there have been moments when my impetuous nature came very near forcing me to cast aside dull business, to forget my position, to hold you in my arms. Mr. Potter, you you felt like this for some time. Since the moment I first laid eyes on you, Mrs. Kendall, you will forgive me, won't you? I fear my heart has got a little the better of me. Please, Mr. Potter, don't feel that way. I, I admire you for saying it. Mrs. Kendall, Althea, will you do me the very great honor of... Of... Of what, Worthington? Of becoming Mrs. Potter. Oh, oh Worthington, I, I don't know what to say. Will you, Althea? Well, a girl has to have time to think, Worthington. One can't decide so... so suddenly. Don't think, Althea. Listen, listen to your heart. I must have time. I... I'll let you know when you come next Friday. Say it now, Althea. No, no, I must get hold of myself. Next Friday, Worthington... Next Friday. Too bad, Worthington. Next Friday. Seven days of waiting. And you've got to know now, don't you? Particularly after the phone call you get from Stratton, your broker, that afternoon. I can't understand it, Stratton. Don't you see, man? I've given you every cent I have. I can't advance more money. I'm sorry, Potter. Only one answer, then. I'll simply have to sell you out. You can't do that. I, I'd i be ruined. How much do I have to put up? Ten thousand this afternoon. Ten thousand. Market's barely holding. Ten thousand will jack it up for the time being. But, but listen, Stratton. Uh, Potter, this is your money you're playing around with, isn't it? How dare you? Sorry, old boy. 
too bad to have to put it to you this way. 9,500 this afternoon, or we sell you out. And it isn't your money, is it, Worthington? It belongs to Althea Kendall. Somewhere you've got to find $9,500. At 2.30 that afternoon, you're in the vault of the bank, going over the contents of Althea Kendall's safe deposit box. Yes, it's a desperate measure, but you're ready to try anything. Stock certificates, bonds, mortgages, but nothing negotiable. Nothing you can turn into 10000 in cash. Then suddenly, you recognize something in the bottom of the box. An earring. A very old one with an emerald in the center surrounded by small rubies. You remember now. The mate to it was stolen years ago. And Althea has left it in the vault ever since undisturbed. There'd be no reason in the world for her to get it out again. It'll probably stay there till she dies. Uh, yes, Mr. Potter, I thoroughly agree with you. It's a very fine piece. Please come to the point, Mr. Graves. How much will you pay for it? Uh, let me examine it again. Mm. Yes, it's a genuine Italian Renaissance without a doubt. Perhaps even a Cellini. Looks like his work. It's a tragedy, of course, that you've lost the mate. The matched pair would bring at least a hundred thousand, perhaps even more. A hundred thousand? Yes, but for the single earring, though, I, I'm afraid 10,000 is the best I can do. Uh, very well. There's just one thing, Mr. Graves. If you haven't sold it, I'd like an understanding that I can buy it back in, say, a week or ten days. I'd agree to pay you your profit, of course. That is fair enough. Uh, my price will be 12,500. I must warn you, however, that I won't hold it if I find a buyer. I understand, Mr. Graves. I'll let you know the moment I want it. Now, about the cash. <laughs> Yes, yes, go on, Stratton. The 10,000 got here in the nick of time, Potter. But you're going to need the rest before you're through. How much? 50,000, roughly. You think the market will hold until, say, next Friday? I don't know. Can you have the funds by then? I'll get them, Stratton. I'll get them. <laughs> With the prologue of Solid Citizen, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. This Thursday, July 4th, you'll be celebrating Independence Day. 170 years of independence for America. The land for folks who love the independent way of life. Today, with more and more returning veterans expressing a desire to get into business for themselves, there's a tremendous rebirth of that independent spirit. And that's good, because independent businessmen are capable of great things. For instance, not long after World War I, a small group of young Westerners formed their own oil company, Signal Oil Company. In the face of what seemed overwhelming competition, these determined young men succeeded in bringing to Western motorists the first anti knock gasoline at regular price. They sold Signal gasoline only through independent service stations, just a handful of them at that time. But motorists liked Signal products, liked them so well that the Signal organization grew and grew until today independent Signal dealers serve seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Now, obviously, there must be good reasons why so many motorists have switched to Signal. You can discover these reasons for yourself by just stopping at your own neighborhood Signal dealers. There you'll find the tops in gasoline and automotive lubricants backed by Signal's 15-year tradition of quality. And you'll enjoy more thorough, more conscientious service because Signal dealers, being in business for themselves, have an incentive to serve you better. A fine example of the American way of doing business that has made and kept our land such a great place in which to live and make a living. And now, back to the whistler.
Well, Worthington, your good name is at stake, isn't it? Your dignity, your social standing, your honor. It all depends now on one thing. Each day you watch the stock tickers nervously. Each day you breathe a sigh of relief when the exchange closes and the stock is held. Yes, Worthington. Only one thing can save you. Althea's answer to your proposal of marriage. Somehow you live through until Friday and hurry out to Althea's home. Althea. Worthington, it's good to see you. The suspense was unbearable, Althea. You have no idea what I went through. There were several times when I almost gave in. I even had the receiver off the hook at one point. I'm so awkward at this sort of thing. Why, Worthington, not at all. I, I think you're rather skillful. Why, why, thank you, my dear. It's, uh, it's very kind of you to say that. You, you do love me, don't you? Althea, you'll never know how much I need you. I've come to the crossroads, Althea. One way leads to you, to your love, to the happiness we'll find together. The other way, to, to loneliness and misery. Althea. Yes, Worthington. You... You have decided, haven't you? Yes, Worthington, I've decided. It was a dreadfully difficult decision to make. I I couldn't make it alone. You went to someone? Well, Dr. Strickland came to the house, of course, on his weekly visit. My heart, you know. Oh, yes, your heart. He didn't entirely approve. Oh, that's ridiculous. Your heart is... My heart is not very good, Worthington. He was a little alarmed about my excitement. I see. I, uh... I think we should be entirely frank, don't you, Worthington? Why, of course, Althea. The doctor suggested that perhaps it was my money you wanted. That's outrageous. It's it's libelous. How dare he insinuate such a thing? What did you tell him? I told him to leave the house. Why, I should think you would. You see, that was the day I decided to marry you. Althea, darling, I knew you would. It's so right for us. Just a minute, Worthington. Eh? That was three days ago. You haven't changed your mind. There must be a power somewhere, Worthington, to take care of lonely old ladies. Oh, I don't understand. Do you recognize this, Worthington? Why, why, it's an earring, isn't it? Yes, an earring. Where did you get it? I can understand why you're curious. Uh, Mr. Barclay brought it to me yesterday afternoon. Barclay? In response to an advertisement I've been running in the collector's magazine for years. Ever since one of the pair was stolen. They were very valuable, you see. My first husband bought them for me in Italy. Of course, I went to my safe deposit box immediately to get out the mate to it. I see. Naturally, marriage is out of the question, Worthington. I have no alternative but to expose you for the cheating, lying embezzler that you are. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't dare disgrace me, do you hear? Do you understand Mr. that? Possibly. You're not going to toss me out of the gutter after ten years. I won't allow it. Yes. I won't be disgraced and held up as a laughing stock. I'd kill you first. Oh, Mr. Potter, you please don't. stupid, stumbling old hag. Mr. Do you think I'd marry you? Yes, it was your money, your filthy pile of gold. I've taken it for years. That's all I wanted. I bowed and scraped and groveled in the gutter for you. And you're not going to open your mouth, you hear? Yes, I'd kill you. I'd kill you in a minute. Right now, if I had to. Althea, what's the matter? She's dead. I didn't touch her. Her heart. Yes. The doctor was right. The excitement. Her heart. Yes, Worthington, she's dead. It was too much for her heart. Your knees give way and you sit there crazily on the floor, trying to gather your wits, wondering what to do. And then gradually you become conscious of something sharp in your right hand. The earring. There in your right hand is your reputation, Worthington. Your dignity. You're holding $100,000 in your right hand, uh, providing you can get the other one. The mate to it you sold to Mr. Graves. Quietly, you get up from the floor, walk to the telephone, and call Dr. Strickland. You'd better get over here right away, Doctor. I, I'm afraid she's gone. The excitement, you know, her heart. <laughs> The doctor is satisfied with your explanation. And you stay until he finishes the examination and completes the death certificate. But you're impatient, aren't you, Worthington? The earring is burning a hole in your pocket. 
And the moment you can get away, you hurry downtown to Mr. Graves' jewelry shop. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Graves. is out, Mr. Potter. Well, I tell you, this is urgent. It's, it's a matter of life and death. I've got to get the mix of this hearing. Oh, well, I can tell you about that, sir. Eh? He sold it a few days ago to a man named Straker. What? Who is Striker? Well, he has an off shop in Trinidad, Port of Spain. He left Monday night by plane for Miami. Where is he staying? I believe he said the Bishop Hotel. When is Mr. Graves coming back? Oh, I, I could not say. He was very indefinite. Very well. You may tell him he can contact me at the Bishop Hotel in Miami. But uh, where are you going? To get that earring. Good day. Hello? Now listen, Stratton. I am only going to tell you once. Sell 500 shares immediately, regardless of the market, and have the cash ready for me in half an hour. Yes, Worthington, time is everything now. You're gambling for high stakes, aren't you? It's an eight-hour flight to Miami, but you don't relax for a moment. And long after midnight, you're hurrying again, this time in the lobby of the Bishop Hotel. A clerk is on duty. Please hurry, will you? It's very urgent. I have no time to lose. Striker, you say? It's spelled with an I or a Y? Eight heavens, I don't know. Try both of them. All right, sir. Hmm. Now, let's see. Mahoney, Robertson, Seville, Stanley. Ah, here we are. Algernon Striker. Spelled with an I. I don't give a hang how it's spelled. What room is he in? He was in 418. Checked out five days ago. Tuesday, I believe. No. Oh, but I have his forwarding address here, if it'll help any. What is it? Uh, number 22, Admiralty Road, Port of Spain, Trinidad. It's going to take you another precious day, Worthington, but you can't turn back now. Somehow you live through the plane trip to Port of Spain. Somehow you arrive at Mr. Stryker's curio shop on Admiralty Road. The clerk is very accommodating. Oh, yes, sir. Of course I recognize the earring. It's a handsome piece, isn't it? Please, please tell me, where is Mr. Stryker? Oh, I'm afraid he won't be back for a day or two. Been out on buying trips a lot lately. I see. You say you recognize the earring? Recognize, of course. Genuine Italian Renaissance. Our friend, I'd say it was a Cellini. You know, if you have a mate to it... Mr. Stryker has no mate to it. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Not anymore. What do you mean? Well, he sold it to a Mr. Bolanus in Miami. Back to Miami, Worthington. Back to the northbound plane. And the address of Mr. Bolanus the clerk gave you. You're tired now, aren't you? Very tired. And there's something else. A terrible, stabbing suspicion in the pit of your stomach. You have a premonition of what's coming the minute you take the earring and show it to Mr. Bolanos. Why, yes, of course, Mr. Potter. It's the same piece. I bought it from Stryker and sold it to a Mr. Barclay. Barclay, yes, Barclay. Yes, it seems a woman in Boston had been advertising for it for some time. Barclay, of course, had been on the prowl after it for years. I believe he intended to sell it to her. I see. Uh, is there anything else I can do, sir? No, nothing So that does it, Worthington. The bubble has burst. Ridiculous, isn't it? You're sure now, Worthington. The earring you've been chasing is the one you hold in your hand. So there's no way you can save your honor. But there is a way to preserve the last vestige of dignity. You stop at a pawn shop in Miami and calmly buy a thirty-eight revolver and then return to the Bishop Hotel. There's a telegram waiting for you, a message from Stratton, discreetly suggesting that in view of the approaching audit of Mrs. Kendall's estate, it might be well for you to produce the missing funds. But it doesn't matter now, does it, Worthington? You go up to your room and lock the door, place the revolver and the earring before you on the desk, take out a sheet of paper and begin to write. And therefore, in view of the approaching situation... I made every effort to procure funds to cover. This failing, I have determined to take the only honorable way out, and I trust that the above facts will justify me, at least in part, and preserve a bare shred of honor to my memory. The 
earring slips off the desk as you write. But you don't even bother to pick it up. Calmly, deliberately, you seal the envelope and address it to the executor of Althea Kenyon's estate. And then, just as you pick up the revolver... Mr. Potter? Mr. Potter, it's the maid. <sighs> Blasted maid of the train like this. Yes? I've come to clean sense. You'll have to do it later. I'm very busy. I'm sorry, sir. I won't get another chance. I tell you, I... There's another thing, sir. The clerk told me to tell you there's a registered package for you at the desk. What? Yes, sir. It's quite valuable. He says he told me... Never mind. Yes, go on. Uh, Go in and do your cleaning. I'm going down to the desk. Where is it? Where is it, man? Hurry. Uh, Yes, sir. I put it in the safe. Just a moment. It was insured for such a large amount, I thought it best... Will you hurry? Yes, sir. Now, let me see. Ah, here we are. Ah, it seems to be from Boston. Give it to me quickly. Uh, now, why do they tie things so deuce it tight? Ah, there we are. Ha, a letter. Sorry, my clerk misinformed you. The earring was not sold to Stryker. I had gone out to show it to a client... On the afternoon you arrived, Stryker purchased several other items, but not the earring. In view of our agreement, I enclose it herewith and will expect your check in the amount of $12,500 by return mail. Regards, Albert P. Graves. Where? Where is it? Ah! There were two of them after all. At last. I got it. The Whistler will be back in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about a photograph that should interest every driver. Perhaps you saw it in the full-page color ad on new Signal Premium Motor Oil that appeared in yesterday's American Weekly magazine or in recent issues of Pictorial Review, This Week, or Sunset Magazine. At any rate, this unretouched photograph showed two pistons taken from two identical motors each of which had been driven for 79,000 miles. The only difference between them was that one motor used today's finest straight motor oil, while the other used Signal's amazing new type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific new compounds. But man, what a difference in those pistons. By actual test, there was only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear on the piston using new Signal Premium Motor Oil. Yes, those five compounds in new Signal Premium Oil really make a difference in the way your motor runs. So for a sweeter running motor, switch now to Signal Premium Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Worthington, it was a wild goose chase, wasn't it? An error on the part of Mr. Graves' clerk sent you flying to Trinidad for nothing. The second earring was in Boston all the time. But you don't care about that now. The point is that at long last you have both of them. The hundred thousand dollars is almost in your hands. The honorable name of Potter will soon be unimpeachable, just as it always was. You stand at the hotel desk. Excitedly holding the earring Mr. Graves sent you and fumble in your pocket for the other one. Then you suddenly remember you left it on the desk while you were writing your letter. In a half minute, you're back at your room. Locked. The maid's gone. <sighs> Let's see. Left it on the desk. Uh, it was here. I left it. Oh, yes. It came to the floor. Must be here. Couldn't have disappeared. Let's see. It was there on the desk. Must have dropped so. Where is the confounded thing? Maybe under the radiator. Uh, no. No, not there. Perhaps the bed. Where is it? It must be here. It must be. What's that? Oh, the maid, of course. The vacuum cleaner in the room next door. You gave me a terrible... Get out of my way. Mr. Potter, what... I said get out of my way. Give me that vacuum cleaner. There there we are. How do you get inside this thing? Oh, please, Mr. Potter, you'll get dirt all over the road. Get away, I said. 
Blast it. Huck. They'll know that I'm using knife. Oh, don't rip the bag, Mr. Potter. Oh, please. Don't worry. I'll buy you a new one. There. There we are now. Mr. Potter, you're getting uh, dirt all over. Uh, quit your bowling. It's here, I know. Somewhere in the filth. Somewhere. It's got to be here. But it's not. What are you looking for? An earring. A gold earring set with an emerald. Here. Here. Like this one. The mate to it. Oh. You... You haven't seen it, have you? Why, no, sir. Don't lie to me, you little gutter snipe. You stole it, didn't you? No. Didn't you? No, I didn't. You Please found it on the floor of my room. Where did you put it? Answer me, you little heathen. Where did you put that earring? Well, I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. You'll tell me the truth if I have to wring it out of you to hear. You hear? Where did you put it? Where? No. Not that gun. Don't shoot. Please. Answer me. What did you do with it? I'll kill you out of it. No, wait. You keep out of there. Put that gun down. Put it down. Like I said. What's the matter with you? Let go of my arm. Good work, Peter. There was nothing else I could do. He would have killed her. He's dead. He, he said I stole his earring. The mate to the one in his hand. That's all right, Ernestine. You don't have to worry, Porter. I saw the whole thing. Yeah, thanks. Guess we'd better put him on the bed. Give me a hand, huh? Yeah, sure. Pick up the earring, Ernestine. Such a pretty one. Easy now. There we are. I'll call the police. Hello? Hello, operator. Will you connect me with the police department, please? Scared me half to death. Yeah, I wonder what it was all about. Oh, it's awful. Oh, look here. Just finished writing a letter. <laughs> well, I guess the least I can do for a poor guy's mail it from. I thought he'd kill oh, me. Oh, Ernestine, maybe you better sit down for a while, huh? <laughs> What's the matter? Look, they're in the bed by his foot. Huh? Well, I'll be. Fell out of his trouser cup when we laid him down. It's the mate to this one. The other earring. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Norman Field and Leora Thatcher. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, 
I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Confession. Only a week before, Marty Heath had thought to himself how wonderful it was to be a part of New York in the spring, with the grass turning green in Central Park and the crocuses blooming in the flower beds. Just a week ago. Now it was different. It was a cold city, a city without a heart. Yes, something had happened to Marty Heath that had taken the heart out of everything. Life had lost its purpose. Nothing had meaning anymore. He smiled bitterly to himself and crossed his fingers as he walked through the revolving door into the main office of the Ajax Life Insurance Company and across the cold marble floor to the application counter. The clerk was efficient and artificially friendly, just like all the rest of them. My name is Martin Heath. I was here yesterday afternoon. Martin Heath? Oh, yes, I have your application. Let's see... Mm-hmm. Married, wife, Clara Heath, living at 28 E 64th Street. No other dependents. That's right. Mm-hmm. The application was for a $20,000 policy, wasn't it? That's right, payable to my wife. Yes. Take effect tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, will you excuse me a moment, Mr. Heath? Of course. I'll have to look up your file. Uh, pardon me. You got a match? Uh, yeah. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Cigarette? No, no, thanks. Getting yourself a little policy, huh? I hope so. Well, you won't have any trouble. You know the old saying, there's no one with endurance yeah. like... It. What's the matter? Huh? Was something wrong? Look, suppose we talk about you, huh? Oh, sorry. I just happened to see you were getting yourself a policy. Sure. Here. Skip it. By the way, my name's Blaine. See you later, huh? Okay. Huh? See me later. Here we are, Mr. Heath. I have your file. I'm awfully sorry, but our medical department has a report from a Dr. Chandler that Yeah, he... I know. It's all right. Skip it. Thanks for your trouble. Yes, Marty. They have the report from Dr. Chandler, too. They're awfully sorry, but they can't accept your application. Today, it's the Ajax Insurance Company. Yesterday, it was the National, and the day before, the Atlantic. Yes, Marty, it's a cold city, full of cold people. And you can't even confide in the one person who means everything to you. Please, Clara, I don't want to say any more. Marty, you've worried me to death all week. I called the office, and they had no idea where you'd gone. I told you I was out to lunch with a customer. You're not telling me the truth, Marty. Don't you see, darling? I, I know there's something terribly wrong, and I want to tell you. There's nothing wrong. Can you understand that? There's nothing wrong. Marty. Oh, I'm sorry, Clara. I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, look, darling, let's forget about it. Let's go out and put away a swell dinner and take in a show. I think I can get us a couple of seats down at the Barrymore. And, and what about it, huh? All right, dear. Let's forget about it. But, Clara, your wife doesn't forget about it, and neither do you. The whole evening is unreal, both of you trying to ignore the strange coolness that has come between you, trying to smile, making jokes that fall flat, trying not to notice the awkward silences that come so often. You promised yourself you'd never tell her, Marty. It's best that way, isn't it? It's after midnight when you get home, and you're both tired, but you can't sleep. You're still wide awake, staring up at the ceiling when you hear the clock downstairs strike three. Marty? Yeah? I thought you were awake. 
can't seem to relax. Neither can I. Uh... Marty? Yeah? Marty, will you do me a favor? Sure. If... If it's somebody else, will you tell me? Somebody else? Another girl. Oh, Clara, Clara, darling. <laughs> I'm so worried, my... There'll never be anyone else, Clara. Believe that, will you? Oh, Marty, I love you so. Don't make it hard for me, dear, please. <laughs> what is it, Marty? What is it? It's a... I can't tell you, Clara. I can't. <laughs> No, Marty, you can't tell her. And you made Dr. Chandler promise he wouldn't tell her either. You leave the next morning before she awakens to wander the streets again, wondering what to do. For want of a better place to go, you end up in a bar on 3rd Avenue. Yes, sir. Well, it be. Double scotch, plain water. Double scotch, plain water. Hello? What? Oh, it's you. Hey, mind if I join you? Go ahead. Thanks. You remember me? Saw you at the insurance office yesterday. Named Blaine. Yeah. Uh, what's yours? Is it important? Might be. Heath, Marty Heath. Hey, uh, double scotch and water. I'll be 85. Oh, here, let me get this. Uh, uh, keep the change box, huh? Thank you. This a hobby of yours, buying drinks for strangers? <laughs> yeah, I got a special on Maybe we'd better find us a book somewhere, Marty. I want to talk to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sit down. Thanks. Yeah. Now. Now, I suppose you want me to tell you all about myself. No, no, no. No, I know everything about you I want to know. For instance? For instance, I know you're going to die in less than three months. Who told you that? I was waiting to see Dr. Chandler the other day when he gave you the bad news. Standing right outside the door. What were you doing up there? He's my doctor, too. I was sort of interested in your position, Mr. Heath. That's why I followed you. Watched you make a fast pitch to those life insurance companies. What business is this of yours? I'm coming to that. You're worried about your wife, aren't you? Wonder who's going to take care of her. What's going to happen when you're gone? I don't blame you. I'd worry, too, if I was in your shoes. Go on. I'll give you a policy, Mr. Heath. Ten thousand bucks cash on a barrel head. No questions asked. That ought to take care of her for a little while. Where do I come in? It's very simple. Guy's lying on the floor in an apartment on the other side of town. His head is bashed in with a beer bottle. What? What do you mean? What do you want? I told you it was simple. You only got three months to go anyway, Marty. What can you lose? Yeah, but what's it all about? Who can... Wait a minute. I'll show you something. There you are. Count it. Ten thousand bucks cash. That ought to take care of your wife for a while. Where do I come in? It's all yours, Marty. All you gotta do is confess to that murder. The prologue of Confession. The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. When you were out driving over the 4th, was part of your fun spoiled by the way other cars left you behind on the getaway or climbed ahead of you on hills? Well, don't give up. Cheer up. There's probably lots of pep and performance left in your motor that you're not getting out of it. That's why tonight, for the benefit of you drivers who may not yet have tried Signal's great new gasoline, I want to pass along the good news about this new super fuel that's engineered especially to put the fun back into driving. You see, science actually rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing new power into new Signal gasoline. Power you'll actually feel as your motor springs to life the instant you touch the starter. Power you'll see as your car steps ahead in traffic with pickup that makes you proud. Power you'll hear 
in the knock-free purr of your motor as you breeze up those steep hills and high. Ah, but even that's not all. There's an extra bonus of extra miles. You see, because signals increase power helps you get maximum efficiency from your motor. Well, naturally, it also helps you get maximum miles per gallon. And that's why those new signal billboards, the ones identified by Signal's big circle sign in yellow and black, now say, you go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Marty, it's quite a proposition. $10,000 cash on the line. And all Mr. Blaine expects to get for his money is the rest of your life. And he's pretty sure of himself, isn't he? You can see it in his eyes as he sits opposite you, watching you carefully. He knows everything. He knows you're going to die. That there was no arguing with the laboratory test Dr. Chandler showed you. That in three months or less, you'd be gone and Clara would have to face it alone, without money. And he knows, too, that Clara is everything. Well, what about it, Marty? I I don't know. What's it all about? The guy's name is Stanley Roble. I killed him. Does that answer your question? But why? Poker game. Last night in his apartment. I was the last to leave. Had a lucky night, and he decided he didn't want me leaving with his money. Came at me with a beer bottle. Well, then you can get off. It was self-defense. Anyone else could. But not me. You see, Marty... I'm an ex-con. Oh. You need the dough and you're going to die anyway. You'd be doing me quite a favor, Marty. Yeah, I know. Listen, I... I got to think this over. I just can't. Okay. I'm going to trust you, Marty. I'll be waiting for you in this booth at five o'clock. Will you know by then? Yeah. I'll know by then. You leave him there, walk out of the bar and into the crowded avenue, and just keep walking. All you can think of is Dr. Chandler and the cold, accurate laboratory reports of Clara, alone in a matter of days, of Blaine and his $10,000. And you know it's wrong, don't you, Marty? But if you turn him down, what's going to happen to Clara? Yes, Marty, what's going to happen to Clara? Hello, Clara. Marty, darling, what are you doing home? It's only... I know, I, I, I don't feel so hot. I thought I'd take the afternoon off. Oh. Well? Well, what? You usually start asking questions about now. Go ahead. I'm not asking any more questions, Marty. I see. Aren't you going to take off your hat? Oh. Oh, yeah. Come here, Clara. I, I want to talk to you for a minute here on the chair by the window. All right, Marty. That's it. I remember we used to sit this way a lot, watching the people down there in the street, feeling sorry for them because they'd never have what we had. Yes, I remember. Clara, you just said you weren't going to ask any more questions. Will you make that a promise? All right, Marty. I'm going to do something pretty soon, Clara, something terribly strange, something you probably won't understand for a long time. Maybe you'll never understand it. Marty, what are you talking about? You're asking questions. I'm sorry. It's going to make you wonder about me. It might even make you lose faith in me. I don't know. I want you to promise you'll remember one thing. Yes, Marty. That I love you. That you're the only thing in the world that matters to me. Oh, Marty. Marty, I've got to know. You've got to tell me. No, please, darling. Please try to understand. I don't. I don't understand. I'm your wife, Marty. Don't you see? I'm your wife. I've got to know. Oh, please, Marty. Please. I better go. No. Don't go, Todd. Don't leave me here. Tell me, tell me whatever it is. I can take it, Marty. I'll help you. I'll, I'll do anything. Clara. I can't go on like this. I can't live without you. Goodbye, darling. <laughs> Blaine. Sit down. Have you thought it over? Yeah, I thought it over. Well? Put the money on the table, huh? 
sure. You can count it if you want. No, that's okay. What do I do now? You're a good kid, Marty. All right. Number one, you go to this address at 8 o'clock tonight. Yeah. You'll find Robo there on the floor with a bottle right next to him. I want your fingerprints in that bottle, clear? Okay. Number two, you write a confession letter to the police. Well, what'll I tell him? I have no motive. I don't even know the guy. Uh, you can tell him when you found out you were going to die, you decided you had to have the money for Clara. You found out about the poker game. Knew Robo was drunk and there's a problem with a lot of dough lying around. Yeah, but I'll figure it out, haven't you? I think so. So, you, you got the dough. But you had to kill Robo to get it. That's what changed everything, you see. You didn't figure on murder. So you had to get it all off your chest. That's why you wrote the letter. That's it, Marty. That's all I want for my ten grand. You'll get it. So that's all he wants for his money, Marty. And you're going to give it to him. Once more, you walk out of the bar and into the streets. The money feels good in your inside breast pocket, snug against your chest. You try and forget about Clara now and concentrate on the shops on Fifth Avenue, St. Patrick's Cathedral, Rockefeller Center. You see something new in all of it, something haunting and precious. Now that you're about to leave it for the last time. Finally, you look at your watch. Ten minutes to eight. Yes, sir, taxi. 128 West 86th. Right. You arrive at 8 o'clock sharp. Take the automatic elevator to the fifth floor. Walk down the hall to Robles' apartment and let yourself in with the key Blaine gave you. And there he is, sprawled on the floor with an ugly wound in his head. The bottle lying next to him. On a desk in the corner of the room with some stationery and a pen. It won't take you long, Marty. Maybe five minutes. It's over now. You've left your fingerprints everywhere, and you're careful to leave a first-class impression on the doorknob as you carefully lock it behind you. Walk over to the mail chute and drop in the letter you just wrote. Address to the New York police. And then, just as you start for the elevator... Oh, my God, you... I've been all over the floor. I didn't know what your partner... You've got to get out of here. I saw you in the bar with that man. Hurry up. The elevator. You've got to tell me, Marty. All right. I'm going in there. I'm going to find out... Get out of there. Let go of me. Listen. Listen, darling. There's a dead man in there. Marty, you... I can't explain now. Come on, into the elevator. Marty, you killed him. That's no, why you I didn't... didn't kill him. Listen, baby, you've got to believe me now. You've got to have faith in me. Oh, where are you going now? I'm going to get a taxi and take you home. I don't want you mixed up in this. Marty, Marty. Please, Clara. Please. Why don't you tell me? All right. All right, Clara. I'll tell you. So you tell her, Marty, because there's nothing else to do. You can't hold it back any longer. And you discover suddenly that you never really knew her. She was right when she said she could take it. It's nearly ten when you arrive back at your apartment. You don't turn on the lights. Somehow it's better with the two of you sitting there in the quiet darkness. Well, darling. Huh? What now? Don't get the letter in the morning. Are we going to wait for it? It's the sensible thing, I guess. With three months left. Should we be sensible? I don't know, Clara. I don't... Someone at the door. No. Let me go. Yes? Sorry to bother you so late. My name's Muller. I'm looking for a Martin Heath. Oh. I've been told he lives here. Well, as a matter of fact, it is his apartment. But you see, Mr. Heath is subletting it to me. My name is Thomas. Uh-huh. You happen to have his address? Yes. 25 Wellfield Way, New Rochelle. Oh, thank you. I'll check it. Good night. Good night. Marty! Why did you lie to him, Clara? I told you there's no use. Marty, I couldn't let him take you. I couldn't. They're right on the job. I'm sure they haven't even got the letter yet. The neighbors must have heard us back there in the hall. Broken into the apartment. Darling, 
You can't throw it away. It's it's our three must not there. The whole state will be looking for me in the morning. We haven't got a chance. We can try. At least we can try. Where can we go, Clara? Anywhere. Let's just take a plane. Oh, why kid ourselves? They'd find... Three months, Marty. Our last three months. Okay. Let's go. Yes, you know it's crazy, Marty. But you're going to try it anyway. There was nothing in the bargain about running away. At midnight, you arrive at the airport. There you are, sir. Two tickets, two and all. Better hurry. Train leaves in five minutes. And at eight o'clock the next morning, you're signing the register of a New Orleans hotel. George, Ellingson and wife, Pittsburgh. There you are. Thank you, sir. Boyle, take your bags right up. Travel agent will be in around nine if you want to check on that passage to Havana. I'm afraid, though, you'll have to wait till the end of the week. They're booked up pretty solid. And he's right. You managed to book passage on the boat leaving Saturday for Havana and settle down to wait for three days, knowing that by now the papers in New York are out with a story and the search is on. You'll never leave the hotel room. Clara does whatever errands are necessary and arranges for your meals to be sent up, telling them you're ill. Then finally, on Saturday morning... It's the boy with breakfast. I'll go. Hello, Mrs. Thomas. What are you doing here? You remember me, of course. The name is Muller. You led me quite a chase. Wait a minute. You have no right to come... All right, Muller. What do you want? You should have known you couldn't get away with it, Heath. Let's forget it, huh? Chalk it up to experience. Maybe I better get my coat. Why? You're not going anywhere. At the moment, at least. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, whenever the New York cops get here. Incidentally, I sent them a wire this morning. They're on their way. What are you talking about? Aren't you... I'm a private detective, Mrs. Heath, employed by the Zenith Laboratories. It seems that they made a pretty bad mistake a while back. Might have involved them in a damage suit. What do you mean, a mistake? Well, three weeks ago, Dr. Chandler made a test on you and sent it to the laboratory for analysis. A red and white differential. Don't ask me what it was. Mistake? Yes, they got your test mixed up with somebody else's. What? There's nothing wrong with you, Heath. You're as healthy as I am. Too bad you went and bought yourself a seat in the electric chair, isn't it? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But right now, I've got some eye-opening facts for you drivers who wonder whether the kind of oil you use in your motor really makes any difference in the way your motor runs. Unfortunately, you can't see inside your motor. But I did see inside two test motors this week, and what I saw just downright amazed me. The motors were identical. They had both been run for 6,600 miles at 62 miles per hour. The only difference was that one motor used today's finest straight motor oil, while the other used Signal's new type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific compounds, Signal Premium Motor Oil. But get this, after the test, there was only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear in the motor that used Signal Premium Oil. Yes, those five scientific compounds in new Signal Premium Oil really make a difference in the way your motor runs. Good reason why wise drivers are switching fast from old-fashioned straight motor oil. Good reason for you to make your next oil change a change to the new type Signal Lubricant that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Marty, it was all a mistake. This story of your having three months to live was an error. But there is still your confession of murder. You know it's useless to run away, that the only thing to do is face the music, even though you know you haven't a chance. That they'll probably laugh their heads off when you try and tell them the story of Mr. Blaine and the $10,000 he paid you to confess to his crime. 
You don't even wait for the police to arrive in New Orleans in response to Muller's wire. You take the next plane north, and late in the afternoon, you and Clara walk into the office of the Inspector of Homicide in New York City. Sit down, please. We'd rather stand. I think you'd better sit down. Both of you. So you're the guy who confesses to a murder and leads us on a merry chase halfway across the country. I'd hardly call it a merry chase, Inspector. I agree with you. You should have known you couldn't get away with it. Until yesterday afternoon, it was pretty serious. What do you mean, until yesterday afternoon? Doing a Stanley Rover was pretty ordinary, you know. Routine stuff. Except for one very unusual thing. There were two confessions. What? Yeah. Yours and another one. Tell me, Heath. Why do you think Eddie Blaine was in Dr. Chandler's office on the day the doc told you you were going to die? Well, I don't know. He was one of Chandler's patients. That's right. But Blaine was a pretty good guy after all. Wanted to do the right thing, I guess. Told us the whole story. What are you talking about? Blaine was a poor guy whose laboratory test got mixed up with yours, Heath. He died yesterday afternoon. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Elliot Lewis and Adrian Marden. This program, produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Fred Hegelin and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for today is called A Time to Be Born and A Time to Die. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. before me, before my eyes and under my hands. I am in the midst of life, and yet I am alone. 
a time to plant. May I come in, please? Thank you. No, I have had no experience. I'm willing to start at the bottom and work up in life. Yes, I have certain ambitions. Yes, I will work hard for whatever you want to pay me. I'll do as you say, and I'll live modestly and save my money, and I'll not waste my time. Nor yours, sir. I'll work and study and try to be useful to you and to me. And you'll find I'm a hard worker and honest and conscientious. And when the time comes, you'll promote me, and you'll find that I'm a very good man to have in your organization, sir. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm not afraid of work. I'm always here on time in the morning. I'm here before 9 o'clock, and you're no better than I am. You see that you're here at 9 o'clock, too, or I'll tell a boss and he'll fire you. I'm not going to let you stand in my way. I'm going to be a success in life. I want a better job, and the only better job in this place is his job. And I'm tired of living in a little hall bedroom and never having any money to enjoy myself. I want to be rich and happy. I'm not getting ahead fast enough in this place. I've got to get ahead. Why, no, sir. I, I like John all right. I, I think he's a fine young man. But I could do his work better than he can. I, I told you I'd work and study and try to be useful to you, sir. I'm only being useful when I say... John isn't doing his work as efficiently as he should. Why, thank you, sir. I'm sure you know I'm thinking only of the business. After all, I have worked hard in your behalf, sir. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Gentlemen of the board of directors, I am humbly grateful for this high honor you have bestowed on me. When I first came to this wonderful organization as a seeker after employment, I said to myself, the highest honor I could ever hope to attain is to be a hard-working member of that great, happy family. For that, that is how I think of this great organization of which I am now humbly happy to be the president. Time to kill. No, Marilyn, there's no way out. I, I've tried so hard. I know. I give you credit for that, Marilyn, but it won't work. Now, I'm not being tough about it, my dear, but it just has to happen this way. When did you stop loving me? Oh, my dear, don't ask such silly questions. Tell me when. I said don't be silly, please. Don't be dramatic, my dear. I, I've given you... I know. The best years of your life. Really. I loved you so very much. I wasn't... I mean, you shouldn't have loved me, Marilyn. I, I know I'm not the glamorous type, and... I know. Well, it's all over now, Marilyn. Must it be all over? Must it... I've been over all that before, my dear. Now, if you don't mind. When did you stop loving me? I told you not to ask that. I've got to... Look. Please. i got a new dress. A new dress isn't enough. I'm sorry, Marilyn got to remember my position. I loved you. I'm sorry. Now, let's not get emotional, shall we, please? For my sake? When did you stop loving you? Why, if you must know, Marilyn, I never loved you at all. A time to kill and a time to heal. No, it's only tax money. I pay Marilyn a very substantial sum of money each month. I don't know what else she needs to keep her happy. I think I've been very generous with Marilyn. She has the house, the money. What more does she want? Let's not worry about Marilyn. She's all right. A time to break down. I don't care what you do, Edgar. It makes no difference at all to me. I've got to get out. No, you, you don't really have to get out, Edgar. You still have some stock in the business. Some stock? Well, I said some. But you have most of it. Certainly I have most of it, Edgar. Certainly I have. When you made me president of the company, I made up my mind that by hook or oh, by crook, I was going to get a controlling interest in the company. 
Now I have it, and that's all. I founded this company 45 years ago. And you can have a job with it as long as you live, Edgar. That I promise you. I remember you when you first came to me. You said you'd start at the bottom and work your way up. That I did, Edgar. You said you were industrious. Haven't I been industrious, and Edgar? Honest and conscientious. <laughs> and today you sit in my chair in my office, and you tell me that there'll always be a job for me in my own company. And that I mean, Edgar. There'll be a job for you in this company just as long as you live. break down and a time to build up. Well, no, Mr. Federal, I don't have a controlling interest in the business anymore. No. Yes. Yes. Oh, I look on the company of today with some pride, of course, but it isn't like the old days when I would... I beg your pardon. Oh, yes. Yes, we're branches all over the world now. Under the new management, we've expanded amazingly. Yes, indeed. I'd be very glad to see you, but I think that you should see the chairman of our board of directors. Uh, he's a very remarkable man. Uh, he's personally responsible for the expansion of the company. No, 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 I haven't retired. I'm still with the company. As I said, I don't have a controlling interest anymore, but you can't miss me when you call. I'm in charge of the reception desk just as you come in the front door. A time to meet. I'm very, very sorry. Really, I'm all broken up. Yes, it's been years since I've seen Marilyn, but I was very fond of her. Oh, I'm deeply desolated to hear of her death. Yes, we were separated several years ago, a matter of incompatibility, I suppose you'd say. But I've always maintained a high regard for her. I'm very sorry she died. Miss Iverson, have some flowers sent to this address. Oh, about twenty dollars worth, will you? Some funeral parlor uptown. Thanks. A time to weep and a time to laugh. And Miss Iverson, you won't have to send any more of those checks. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's over with at last. <laughs> a time to mourn. That? Yeah, it's your mourning band. Don't you know what the morning band is? Well, it used to be when somebody died, everybody wore black clothes, see? Old custom. Nowadays, you just get a piece of black cloth and have your tear sewed on the sleeve of your coat. <laughs> I got a fine tailor. Is that for playing piano for? Are you going to sing? Oh, let's play, huh? Play sad music for me. Oh, I'm in mourning, see? My wife died. Oh, we'd separated, but she died. Yeah, I went to school with this little dumpy kind of country girl. Nothing special. She died. You don't understand. I understand, all right, Edgar. You and your friends have connived and plotted. I work behind my back. You haven't been watching the business, you know. I thought I was surrounded by loyal co-workers. You weren't very loyal to me when you took the company away from me behind my back, were you? That's an entirely different situation, Edgar. You know that. It was behind my back. You can't accuse me of dishonesty. I didn't. Well. If you hadn't been spending so much time... Don't you say a word about my fiancé. I had no intention of speaking of her. But you know you haven't been paying much attention to the business. All right. I don't want to talk about it. Well, now listen to me. We're perfectly willing to have you stay on as general manager at a salary. <laughs> a very generous salary because we know your ability. But as to control... I don't want any part of it. You about smart to be this time and I'm leaving. I built this place up from... I had a part in that too, you must remember. Well, I don't want any more of it. I'm through. I'm getting out. Do you understand? 
time to throw away stones and the time to gather stones together. Why, of course, I'm glad to see you at any time. I'll come back with my hat in my hand, I guess. Uh, uh, mm. I don't mean to rub it in, of course, but you understand, don't you? Yes, sir. Now, what was it you uh, wanted? Will you give me your job? Why, uh... uh I blanked my lesson at you, uh, Mr. Harris. Good. Well, uh, have you got anything for me? Uh, let's see. Uh, I've got to get another start, Mr. Harris. Yes, of course. Well, now, I'll tell you what I'll do. You were a very valuable man to us once, my boy. I need a job awfully bad. I, I've been around everywhere, and I... I'm afraid your old job is filled. I know. And we have a very good sales manager. Anything I... Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you wanted to go out on the road for us... Yes, of course. Anything. On commission, of course. A time to embrace. Hello, Julia. You know who this is, Julia? <laughs> That's right. Yes, I know it's been a long time. Yeah, sure. Well, I've had a rough time, Julia. That's why I haven't called you anything, you see. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, I got a new... Uh, I made a new connection today. Yes, the old company, they finally came around after me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> what? Well, well, I was wondering. I, I've got to go out, out of town tonight, and I, I thought maybe we could have dinner together. And... What? What? Oh, uh, well, I drew my expense money, and I... Uh, h- how about it? A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. Oh, I'm sorry, too. Well, uh, uh, that's too bad you couldn't break it. Well, it's all right, but I wish you could. Well, when I come back, then? Yeah, about two months, I'm afraid. Oh, two months ago, by awfully fast, though. Yeah, sure. Yes, of course. All right, Julia, I'll call you. Well. A time to speak. So if you just sign the order blank right here, uh, that's right, this line. Uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. We're always grateful for business, and I'll personally see the deliveries made within ten days. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. I'll wire the office tonight and get things started right away, Mr. Jacobson. Yes, thanks a lot, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, good day, sir. Oh, if you'll have someone give me a certified check, sir. Oh, good. Well, thanks a lot. Well, uh, goodbye, Mr. Jacobson. Mr. Jacobson. I beg your pardon? I mean, what? Canceling. Oh, no, Mr. Jacobson. Why? Oh. Oh, but Mr. Jacobson, I... Well, that was my first... Uh, I beg pardon? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, of course, I understand. Uh, yes, of course. Well, I'm sorry, too, Mr. Jacobson. What's that? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Oh, of course. I, I haven't mailed the check back to the factory. Uh, I'll put it in the mail to you right away. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Goodbye. A time to keep. Hello. Hello. Hello, Julia. Yes, it's me. Julia, what are you doing? I mean now. Julia, listen to me. You love me, Julia? Depends on what. (laughs) Well, listen, I got an idea. Sure, I get ideas. What's this one? Well, let's you and me get married. I have two got a cent. I got a lot of money. I've got a certified check for $10,000 in my hand right now. Sure, it's mine. Sure, it's mine. I can afford to maintain you in the style you've been a... 
What? Why, well, I thought maybe we'd take a little honeymoon in Mexico, darling. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what to do. You put on your pretty new suit. Uh, you got a pretty new suit, haven't you? Uh, and you get on an airplane and you fly out here. Then I'll have a private plane all waiting for you. We'll fly down to Mexico. We'll get married. We'll have a honeymoon that... It's a deal? Okay, darling. I'll meet you at the airport. What am I going to do? Well, if there's any kind of man at all, you'll go back. I'll never go back. A time to win and a time to sow. I'm sorry to see you here. No, really, I am. It was very good of you to come way up here to see me, Edgar. I don't have to call you Mr. Harrison here, do I? No, no, of course not. I'm sorry. I haven't got any name here either, Edgar. Just number 11630. I really am sorry. There was there was nothing I could do, you know. Would you have done anything if you could, Edgar? I... I don't know, my boy. You're still old after all. I know. And I'm paying for it. Are you being treated all right? Oh, yes. I've learned to sew jute bags. I'm very good jute sewer, Edgar. I, I didn't know what jute was before they sent me here. I know now. Look at my fingers. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, it's only another five years, another five billion suit bags to sew, that's all. Is there anything you want? I want to get out. That's what we all want. I know. I lie on my bunk at night and think. If, if there wasn't just some way I could undo what I did all my life. Here is. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Will you go away, please? Who are you? I'm his wife. Oh, goodbye, my boy. Goodbye, Edgar. Well, a time to keep silent. Well, you look fine sitting there in that fine outfit. You're the great big sportsman, the big shot, the money man. A thief. You're going to sit there like a dummy? Why don't you say something? You know what I've been doing? I've been working. I'm a convict's wife. I have to work. Not a single one of my friends will speak to me. I don't dare to be seen in public. Do you know what you've done to me, you you convict? You ruined my life. You're the man I thought I loved. You know why I came up here? Do you know why? A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Why, I thought at first you came to see me. Because you love me, Julia. A time to love. Four 
years and seven months. Five years and five precious months off for good behavior. Four years and seven months, Warden. Four years and seven months, Chicago Red. Four years and seven months, all you tall men with the rifles and the blue suits. Thank you, Warden. I've learned my lesson at such long life. Thank you, society. I paid my bet to you. Thank you, high stone walls and iron gates. Thank you. And goodbye. And thank you, dear Julia, for remembering me just once in a while, the fruit of Christmas time, with the apples and the oranges all neatly sliced in half to show there wasn't a little pile stuck into them. And thank you, I dear, for the messages and the visits that were so far apart and that I waited for so eagerly. I thought you were an old man, Edgar. But I remember now you were only a few years older than I am. And I suppose the business has been going better and better while I've been behind the high walls. And I suppose that's why you look so much happier and so much younger. Or maybe it's only because I've been so unhappy and because I've been growing older so fast, so fast behind the high stone walls. And now uh, thank you for closing the gate behind me. And the air is so fine and so fresh. And and I'm so happy, Edgar. Aren't you happy? I'm very glad you're out now, son. I wanted to be the first to shake your hand. You've been a good friend, Edgar. No, no, it, it's not that. I, I'm sorry for what's happened to you. That's enough. Have you decided what you're going to do now? All I know is I want to see Julia. Do you think that would be wise? That's all I thought about all those years back there, Edgar. Julia sent me packages once in a while, you know, even if she didn't write. Maybe. Maybe what? Maybe she... She doesn't hate me. Son, you've been through a lot. Yes, I have. And what, um... What if you don't find Julia? I'll find her. What if you don't? Why, I... I hadn't thought of that. You've been away a long time. A long time? Why don't you go away from here and try to start all over again? Without Julia? Without Julia. No. No, I won't do that. It might be better that way, son. No. It might be the better way. It might be better not to want to see her. I don't know what you mean. Is she... dead? No. Julia isn't dead. <sighs> well, I was afraid. Maybe she doesn't want to see you. Maybe she won't right at first, but well, I'll tell her. I'll show her. She'll want to see me all right, She'll remember, and she'll love me. No. What? I said no. How do you know? How do you know, I said? A time to love. Because she married me, son. And a time to hate. Listen to me, Edgar. Open your eyes, Edgar, and look at me. I didn't mean... My hands are stronger than I thought, Edgar. I, I didn't mean to kill you, Edgar. I couldn't help it. But, but you're dead, Edgar. It was, it was her hands, Edgar. I, I swear she... Julia. Oh, Julia. Julia, I love... I hate you, Julia. Let me never see you again. Faithless, unspeakable... To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. Begin. No. I am afraid. You must begin. The title of today's Quiet Please story is A Time to Be Born and a Time to Die. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper, the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chapman. And Edgar Staley played Edgar. Marilyn was Joyce Gordon, and Julia was played by Helen Choate. The reader from the book of Ecclesiastes was Athena Lord. 
Music for Pride, please, is played by Albert Berman and sound today was by William McClintock. Now for a word about next week, our writer director, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet, please. Next week, a man returns from the grave where I buried him. Mr. Charles W. Afternoon, the man who knows everything no more than I did. And we'll hear from him again in the Venetian Burn Man. And so until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chapel. Now a listening reminder. For a glimpse under the veil that hides the future, for a commentary that is incisive and based on fact, listen this evening to Drew Pearson. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is WJZ, New York's first station, and WJZ-FM. Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in. Say, how about joining our Shriek of the Month club? We're offering free a shroud-bound copy of Die Alone and Like It. It's about an unsuccessful authoress who dies of marital illness. Yes, her husband got sick of her. However, he was thoughtful enough to bury his novelist wife in the basement. And now at last, she's in the uh, best-seller class. <laughs> And now for tonight's gruesome little item. Oh, uh, you better not disturb that fellow in the corner. He's our ghost of honor tonight. Poor guy. He died last night for lack of sleep. Now he's in for a wake. Meet John Thompson. Age 29, driving a blue coupe across the George Washington Bridge. Heading west. <laughs> Kind of a close night. Heat lightning is dancing up in the sky when I come down off the bridge into Jersey. Running a mobile gas station isn't bad when things are breaking, right? But the way things are, I figure I'll do better out west. I hit the highway and let her out of it. I spot her a few miles past the bridge. She's standing there by the side of the road, out in the middle of nothing. I don't know exactly why, but I stop. Want a lift? Thanks. Now hop in. Going far? Not very. Well, yell when you want me to leave you off, huh? My name's Thompson. John Thompson. Hello, Johnny. Yeah. Hello. Uh, what's your name? And. Uh-huh. Uh, where in particular are you heading for? I don't know. But... I'll know when we get there. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, this ain't the old routine, but... You look like I kind of know you from someplace. Do I? I don't remember from where or when, but your face... Oh, uh, maybe just reminds me of somebody I used to know. Don't anymore. Maybe. Uh... You don't remember me, huh? Should I, Johnny? Well, it would be kind of more sociable. I'll try, Johnny. We go on like that for a couple of three miles. Her not saying anything and me sneaking looks at her. She's pretty young and nice to have next to you, but there's this feeling that I don't know her and don't. And I get to wondering where she's going in the middle of the night. I am. 
Yes, John. Uh, maybe we can get some music. The knob for turning on the radio is over on your side. See? All right. They got these all-night programs for people like us, you know, driving at night or jockeying a truck or sitting up with a sick friend. Our next request number uh, just phoned in this minute by a young lady named Ann. Uh, well, we can't make out your last name, Ann, but anyway, Lou's going right ahead and play it for you. Lou, I the piano, playing Stardust. He plays a nice piano, huh? Very nice. What's funnier? Girl with the same name as yours just phoning in to the show and we start to listen to her? I mean, with the same first name. Is it? Yeah. Well, I guess it's coincidence. I like the daughter. Maybe you better try another station. Why? I like the starter. Yeah, but get another station. I'm happy with this one. Get another station or turn the set off. I don't care which. Do what I'm telling you. Why? Don't ask me why. I can't take that music. It, it bothers me. Now, will you please? No. I said, will you please turn it off? No. Look, it's my car. My radio. I want you to... Oh, never mind. I'll turn it off myself. You better watch the road. You might have an accident. I'll turn it off myself. And I'll let go of my hand. No, I don't want you to turn it off. Let go. i got to keep my other hand on the wheel. I won't let go. I want you to listen to Stardust. I like it. But I don't. I'm warning you. Very quickly. All right. This is what you wanted. I told you to turn it off. Let go of the wheel. You wouldn't listen to me. No. Now it's too late. Stand! It's all black for a while. I remember the streaks of light through the blackness. I shook my head. I was conscious again. I slid forward under the wheel and car hit the tree. Pulled myself up. Get out of the car. Look, it wasn't damaged bad. The bumper taken most of the shock when we hit, and one fender was crumpled. And then I remembered. Damn. She was dead, I knew. I felt her neck give before we crashed. I swallowed hard for a couple of seconds and went back to the car. Looked in. She wasn't there. <laughs> She wasn't anywhere near the car. She hadn't been thrown clear. She must be dead. Still, she wasn't there. Not anywhere. I drove away. Fast. My head don't feel so good, but I stop thinking as I go through the night. I, I do puzzles and arithmetic. Multiplication. Uh, 49 times 76... 102 times 27, so I won't think. But not thinking isn't easy when you're alone, so when I see a diner, I think that's for me. And I stop and get out. I walk over to the diner. The air is still heavy and the crickets are raising cane. I go in. Well, I'll be missing. Oh, uh, Job and a hamburger. Yeah, coming up. Yeah, it's a hot night, ain't it? Huh? Oh, I, I didn't notice you sitting next to me. Yeah, it's plenty hot. You're driving a nice car. Yeah, I, I noticed you're pulling in. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was good. Say, uh, Joe, I uh, I was wondering, you going far? Well, far enough. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. West? Uh-huh. How about me riding with you for a bit? My feet are getting awful tired holding me up. Well, sure, I guess so. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I could use a bit of company for this. Hey, uh, oh, you dropped your coffee. I, I'm sorry. Did I get any of on you? Oh, you missed, but your hands are trembling. Well, I'm tired. Come on, let's get out of here. Hey, that'll take care of my check. But, hey, you ain't finished your hamburger. Oh, I'm not hungry. Well, uh, you mind if I work it over? No, of course not, honey. Let's get out of here. Sure is a dark night, huh? Hurry up, will you? Yeah. 
dark enough to hide a corpse in. So, what did you mean back there by dark enough to hide a corpse in? Nothing. Just an expression. Why? Uh, Seemed like a funny thing to say. I don't think so. Hey. Hey, you better slow down. We're going through a town. That's uh, deserted this hour and night. No, it ain't. Look at that. Down near the corner. Hmm? Huh? Where? <gasps> ah, you seen her, huh? Standing under that lamppost. Pretty as a picture, ain't she? Hey, slow down, will you? Maybe she wants a lift. You're crazy. Well, look, she's giving us the thumb. We're going to pass her in a minute. And it don't bother me. Yeah, but... Hey, hey, she's calling you. She knows you. You can't pass up a girl like that. Will you shut up? Wait, I don't get it. You was willing to give a hobo like me a lift and you don't even know me. You know that She's girl. not there. She can't be. Well, you seen her. No. You looked where I was pointing. You heard her. No. All right, yes, I did, but she's not real. She couldn't be. Why? She's dead. Yeah, how do you know? Because I did... Because I saw her die. Yeah? Yeah, in an accident. A hundred miles from here. Well, then what was she doing under that lamppost? I don't know, miss. Maybe it's a ghost. Maybe I'm going crazy. I seen her. And maybe you're dead, too. And the ghost ride. Well, well, look at you. Chips off an old block of ice. Splinters from the petrified forest. Or are you always that way? Hmm? Oh, you're not really frightened. Just pretending. Well, then, suppose you climb down off that chandelier and listen to the rest of the story about John Thompson, who took a girl for a boogie ride. John and the bum he picked up rode on for a while in silence. Night was closer and heavier, and John was tired. Hey, hey, watch it, will you? Oh, oh sorry, I... Close my eyes for a second. Well, you better keep them open. It's healthier. Yeah. I'm kind of pooped. It's been a long night. That uh, chatter about ghosts. Yeah? How come? Oh, I was kidding. You were, huh? It wouldn't be because... How would you like to get out? I'd like it fine. I get nervous riding with a guy who turns green when you mention corpses. Hey, hey, watch the bridge! Hey, you nearly sunk us in that stream. I can't keep my eyes open. What if I wash my face? Bathe my eyes with cold water? Yeah, that's an idea. Yeah, you can stay in the car. I want to be a couple of seconds. Oh, I'll go along. I, uh, I could use a drink. That water looks good. Dark, peaceful. You know, you could sleep in water like that. Yeah, sure, but you wouldn't wake up. <laughs> Go on, wash. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's too swell. Sure. Cold. Good. Uh-huh. Good for what ails you. But what does ail you, mister? Nothing. I'm tired, that's all. Getting sleepy. I'm better now. Okay. Well, let's get back to the car. I'm walking the rest of the way. What? Yeah. But I want to get there. There's nothing wrong with my driving. I didn't say there was, mister. But are you sure there ain't something wrong with you? All right. Walk. I don't need anybody to ride with. No, mister. You already got somebody. Or something. Riding with you. So I walk back to the car. Get in. I don't pay no attention. The old bum says. Nothing wrong with me. 
Nothing. Start the car and drive off. Down the highway into the darkness. It's a long night. Maybe the longest night I ever lived. But it's only night someplace, west of New York, and that's all. A storm hanging overhead, never breaking. That's all. Hello, Johnny. Hey, sir. Sitting right next to me. When she saw me looking at her, she smiled. Hello, Johnny. Oh, oh. I. I didn't expect to see you again. No, Johnny. Oh, I, I left you so far behind. Not so far behind. Yeah, but I guess you must have got a list of, on some other car, a faster car than mine. Huh? That's how you got ahead of me. Where ahead of you, Johnny? Now, that's the way it was. Sure. You're, you, you're, you're all right, though. I'm all right. Very all right. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, it's funny, ain't it? It'll rain still holding off, you know. You're not going to sworn it a port hours ago. Why are you talking so much, Johnny? Because I'm afraid of it. When will we get there, Johnny? Get where? Where you're going. I don't know. Why? Because I'm going there with you. Oh. <laughs> She ought to sing that song. I told her I didn't like it. I'm not going to tell her again. It won't do any good. This time I'm going to play it smart and sure. Looking straight ahead, watching the road glide under the headlights. So I choked the car. Hey! What is it, Johnny? Uh, it's a motor. Uh, there's be something wrong. Oh. Yeah, I, I better get out and see. I'll wait here. Sure. Get the hood up. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. And? Yes? Yeah, I can fix it, but uh, will you bring me the wrench? Where is it? In the dashboard compartment. All right. I thought it's done. Well, uh, will you bring it to me? There it is, Johnny. Thanks. Now well, all I have to do is... Hey. Hmm? What's that behind you? Where? Well, turn around, you'll see. All right. So she turns her back to me. Looks down the road we came. And I lift the heavy wrench. And I... This time I made sure. She's dead. Lying on the road. But I still gotta make sure she won't... Even dead be riding with me again. So I... I lift her up. Put her back in the car. Get in myself next to her. Yeah, start the car up. I remember the stream. It's not much of a stream, but deep enough for a thin girl to lie in. And that's where I go. It don't take long to get back to the stream and the bridge over it where I stop. Nobody around. Only the darkness and the water flowing underneath where Anne is going to lie. But before I let her go, I dig out my tools. Tire iron, wrenches, a jack, heavy stuff. Tie them to her so she'll lie quiet under the water when I get done. She's heavy now. Heavier than she ever was before. But I lift her over the rail and hold her for a second in my arms, and then I let her go. Drop. Quick and not awful loud into the water. Drop to the bottom of the stream, where maybe, maybe it'll be soft and cool for her. And, and I gotta get away from here. Fast. Fast! <laughs> Every time the wheel turns around, 
Every time the valves open and close. Every time the sparks fire. I'm getting further away from her. This time she isn't going to follow me. This time she's deep under the water with iron tied to her and her head bashed in. Never turn around again and find her sitting next to me. I'd never hear her calling Johnny again. I'd never see her eyes or her thin body again. The clouds are pressing down now. No more moon. Thunder's purring closer like a big cat. I don't care. I'm through with her forever now. I'm so happy I could sing. La da 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 off on on like God's neon sign. The thunder's pounding in my head. I go faster. Get a curve. Take it at six. Stand in there. Lit by the light and it's... The gas pedal down to the floor. The motor's roaring like a hundred horses screaming. We're pulling up the hill with it. With the rain slanting against the window pane like a million fingers tapping on my brain. The top of the hill swept by the window. Wet dress plastered against their bodies. I can't take it much more. The car sliding down the wet road like death on butter. And she's there all the time now, running with the car, face plastered against the closed window next to my seat. Johnny. And you, you're dead. Am I, Johnny? You're dead. I killed you. Don't you remember? No, Johnny. Back there, I hit you. I dropped you into the water. I hit you. You're dead. Am I, Johnny? No, no, no. And please, please. I'm so tired, Johnny. Tired of running away. Isn't the road too long? The road away from oh, me? Go away. Go away, Anne. No. You don't want to drive me mad. No, Johnny. Then what do you want? Just to go with you to the end of your road. But where is that? Why, maybe here. Maybe right here. In this town, Johnny. In this town. small place, and I'm riding through it. The storm's dying out. Dying out. Yeah, and the air's clear now. Fresh after the storm. And? No, she's gone. Now, the thing is, where? Oh, right up ahead. Sure. They always have one. Yeah, with a green light shining over the door. And they're always open. And there's always a sergeant half sleeping in the chair behind the desk. Hello? Hello? Oh, what do you want? My name is John Thompson. All right, so your name is John Thompson. So what? If you check, I think you'll find that I'm wanted. Wanted? For what? For the murder of my wife, Ann Thompson. Huh? Hey, don't move. I've got you covered. I killed her in our apartment in New York City. Come on. Stick your hands out. When I killed her, the radio was on. They were playing starter. <laughs> How'd you like our new arrangement of Stardust? We're billing it this week as tune number one of the murderer's hot parade. With, of course, a boogeyman beat on a new grave lane. <laughs> oh, yes. Before I stop off for a little chat with John in that one-way death cell of his, let me give you a bit of homicidal advice. Never kill your wife with a radio on. Tune in later. <laughs> well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, won't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm-hmm. Innocent.
Sanctum has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. had been found dead in the kitchen of her home in the town of Walkerville. An autopsy revealed that she died of poisoning. Fred Anders, her husband, accused of murdering his wife, had escaped capture, and for the past ten days had been a fugitive from justice. On the evening of the tenth day, I had an unexpected caller. My yes? Are you bought and drink? Yes, I'm great. Will you come in? Yeah. You alone here? Yes, I'm alone. Sit over there, please. I'll talk from here. As you like. Well? Well, what? You said that you talk from here. What would you like to talk about? I guess you don't know who I am. Oh, yes, I'm quite aware of who you are. You're Fred Anders, wanted for the murder of your wife, Sally Anders. And you're a cool one, Greg. I heard you were pretty clever. I get Fred Anders. What are you going to do about it? Nothing at all. As long as you keep your hand in the pocket of your jacket. <laughs> That's smart. I've got a gun in this pocket, Drake. I haven't the slightest doubt of it, Mr. Anders. I... I guess I will. Sit down. Fine. There's a comfortable chair. I'll sit over here where you can keep your eye on me. Yes. It's a good idea. Maybe you're wondering why I dropped in on you like this, huh? I suspect that your purpose is to tell me you didn't murder your wife. Yeah? How'd you figure that out? Didn't take a great deal of figuring, Anders. Obviously, there'd be no other reason why you'd pay me a call. Uh, that's what I call being real smart. Thank you, Jen. Now, Drake, listen to me. I didn't do it. So help me, I didn't. The police seem to think all oh, of the police, those dumb, flat-footed cops. Come, come, Mr. Anders. The police aren't always wrong. All the evidence pointed to your... What case. evidence? The fact that Sally and I had quarreled... The fact that I had threatened to kill her? Did that prove a man guilty of murder? The fact that you ran away and have been in hiding ever since your wife's death doesn't help your case any, Mr. Anders. It doesn't prove me guilty yet. I'm not a fool. What would you have done? Never having killed anyone, I don't know. And I haven't killed anyone either. Thank you. You've got to help me. Oh. Now, Drake, listen to me. You know what it's like to be hunted and hounded, to be afraid of your own shadow, to jump every time a car backfires. No, I'm afraid I don't. I haven't slept for days, Drake. I haven't eaten. I, I can't stand it much longer. I think I'm going crazy. I think I can appreciate how you must feel. Help me, Drake. You have a reputation for a shooting square. I've got money. I'll pay you. That's hardly an inducement, Mr. Anders. If you're guilty, it would be impossible for me to prove you innocent. But I'm not guilty, I tell you. Could I take a chance in coming here if I were? Would I be willing to risk everything on the one hope that you'd give me a break? No, Mr. Anders, I don't think you would. Well, then... Then you believe me. For the moment, I'll... Withhold my opinion, and I'll give you a chance to prove your faith in me. I'll do anything. Believe me, I will. Then give yourself up to the police. Give myself up? Yes. If you know that you're innocent and you believe I can help you, there should be no objection. So that's your game. I haven't any game, Mendes. You're a fugitive from the police. Why, you dirty, double-crossing rat. So you want me to give myself up? You want to get credit for capturing Fred Anders by talking him into it? So that's the kind of a guy you are. Those huh? are my terms, Anders. Take some release. Take them release from her. I'll show you what I'll do to him. Down that gun, Anders. A second murder isn't going to help you. There hasn't been a first yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get this straight. This guy, Anders, came up to your apartment and tried to get you to investigate the murder of his wife. Yes, that's right, Inspector. You refused, and he took a swipe at you with his gun. Yes, and that's way I grappled with him, and the gun went off. The bullet missed, but he knocked you out by hitting you with the gun barrel. That's right. He knocked me out, all right. Hmm. Hmm. What, Inspector? I smell something. Oh? 
You know what you should have done the minute you came to your senses? No, no, I don't. What? You should have called the police and reported what had happened. After all, Anders is a fugitive from... But just... I did call the police and reported what happened, Inspector. Huh? What do you mean? You said yourself that you called me the minute you woke I up. I did, Inspector. You're a policeman, aren't you? Huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I guess I am at that. Yeah, but look. Oh, oh, come, come, Inspector. You'd like credit for capturing the murderer of Sally Anders, wouldn't you? Sure. You mean you know where Fred Anders is hiding? I'm not interested in where Fred Anders is hiding, Inspector. I'm only interested in apprehending the murderer of his wife. That's what we're doing now. Oh, my gosh. Do you mean that Anders talked you into believing he was innocent? No, on the contrary, Inspector. I talked him into talking me into it. What kind of double talk is that? <laughs> Fred Anders, Inspector, had a chance to kill me. He didn't, even though I made him mad enough to want to. So that proves he didn't murder his wife, eh? While we were struggling for the gun, I warned Anders that a second murder wouldn't help him any. Mighty decent of you. Anders replied that there hadn't been a first. Yet. <laughs> you fellas didn't discuss the weather, too, did you? So you see, Inspector, I did my duty as a citizen by trying to capture a fugitive, and I discovered that the fugitive was innocent of the crime as charged. Now, that makes sense, that does. Look, and now I've eased my conscience by reporting the incident to the police, and everything's fine. I knew I smelled something. Somehow or other, I always turn out to be the fall guy in these deals. <laughs> no such thing, Inspector. When we return from Walkerville... You're going to be a hero who captured the murderer of Sally Anders. What are we stopping here for? This isn't where Fred Anders lived. I saw pictures of the place. No, this is the home of Miss Emma Bemis, Inspector. Oh, the babe who discovered the body, eh? Yes, that's right. Is she working in that garden patch over there? Come on, let's go find out. Well, she sees us coming. Say, she's as good looking as her picture. Yes, I see she is. Good morning. Are you Miss Emma Bemis? Oh, my goodness. You must be strangers around here. Everybody knows I'm Emma Bemis. Uh-oh, one of those. Yeah, the inspector. Yes, we are strangers in Walkerville, Miss Bemis. I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Noah Den. Hi. Barton Drake? What a wonderful name. Well, what's the matter with that? And that name's been in our family for years. Well, no, you're stepping right from my petunia bed. Oh, you big... Now, don't get excited. I'm not stepping on your doggone petunias. Oh, big feet. Now I'll have to plant the whole plot over again. Well, for God's sake, how did I know? Stand over there, Inspector. You'll be all right. Uh, I'm all right, honey. Of course you are. Miss Davis, would you mind... Yes? Barton? You don't care if I call you Barton, do you? Not at all. Emma? Here hmm. we go again. It's such a lovely name. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Miss, uh, uh, Emma, Inspector Danton and I are investigating the murder of Sally Andrews. Sally? Yes. It was you who discovered the body, wasn't it? Sure. I mean, yes. Say, wait a minute. Are you two gentlemen officers? Well, yes. In a manner of speaking, we are. And you've come out a wild goose chase. It was Fred, Sally's husband, who murdered her. Who oh, says so? Ebenezer Pringle says so. He's our chief of police. I, I guess I ought to know since it was I who discovered the body. Well, uh, look, lady, just because you discovered the I body... I was the most important witness at the coroner's inquest. Yeah, but... My picture uh, was in every newspaper in the country. So what? My picture's been in the newspaper, too. But they only... called me the beautiful Miss Demer. Who lived next door? I was known as Dandy Danton, the Beau Brummel of Delancey Street. Inspector. Huh? Emma, would you mind telling us the uh, exact circumstances under which you discovered Sally Anders' body? Circumstances? Yes. There weren't any circumstances. I just went over there and found it. Oh. Well, uh, what was your reason for calling on the Anders that morning? Reason? No reason. I just decided to call on them the way neighbors do. That's no answer. Well, it should be. Sally and I had a cup of coffee together most every morning of the week. Oh, poor Sally. Why poor Sally? Why poor Sally? Yeah. Well, how would you like it if your husband was always threatening to murder you? I haven't got a husband. Oh, dear Inspector. Emma, 
Are we to understand that you knocked on the Anders door? When no one answered it, you opened the door, walked in, and found Mrs. Anders lying on the floor? Oh, no. No, it wasn't like that at all. Oh. The door was locked. That's what made me suspicious. Well, I see. No one ever locks their doors in Walkerville. Naturally, I knew something was wrong. Naturally. And what did you do? Do I have to tell you? I'd appreciate it if you would, Emma. Would you, Garson? Pardon me. If I'm in the way... Now, just keep your big feet out of the petunias, Inspector, and everything's going to be all right. Oh, is that so? Now, what you were saying, Emma, what did you do when you found the door locked? I looked through the keyhole. Well, you little rascal. And you saw Sally Anders' body lying on the floor? Yes. It was right there in front of the door. Oh. Then what did you do? I screamed, naturally. I'll bet. And I suppose uh, somebody heard you screaming and summoned the Chief Pringle? That's exactly what happened. My, you're clever, Barton. Yeah, clever. <laughs> Emma, let me tell you about the time... All I... right, Inspector. Huh? Emma, thank you very much for answering all our questions. You've helped us immeasurably. Oh. Now, come on, Dandy Danton. Get your big feet out of the petunia bed. We've got work to do. Ah! Now, uh, look, Bart, mm -hmm. we can't just go in and bust into the Anders home without a warrant. No one's living in the place, and... Uh, yeah? What's the matter? There is someone living in the Anders home. I just uh, moved the behind those curtains. Huh? Where? I didn't see anything. You didn't? No. Perhaps I was mistaken. Mistaken? You? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Bart. You're not admitting a mistake, I are you? I'm sure I was mistaken. You know, my imagination has been playing tricks on me lately. Imagination, eh? Now, that's something I never expected. Come along, Inspector. Let's uh, check and make sure, shall we? Yeah, yeah, that's one way of finding out. Hey, where are you going? From the back door. The back door? But look, the front door's right here, and it's only for... I think we'd better try the back door first, Inspector. Oh, all right. Have it your way. Hey, place is kind of run down looking, isn't it? Yeah, it hasn't been occupied since the day of the inquest. I don't know. Well, it looks as though you did make a mistake after all. Mm. Uh -huh. Let's try the door. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's open. Mm. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything, though. Emma the Beauty just told us that no one in Walkerville ever locked their doors. He must also point it out that Sally Anders did lock her door on the day she was murdered. Come on, Inspector, let's look around. The deserted houses always give me the creeps. What do they keep the shades pulled down for? <laughs> what do you want me to shush for? There's no one here. You said yourself that you... No, no, I couldn't very well help but get it, Inspector. Miss Anders, you must be a relative of Fred Anders. Of course. I'm his sister. Now, what is it you want? What do we want? What do you think we want with everyone yelling and shooting off yes. guns? Shooting off guns? I don't believe I understand. Don't believe you want... Now, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Do you mean you didn't hear any shots? Of course I didn't. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Well, I'll be your mother. Furthermore, if you don't leave at once, I'll call the police. The police? I'm the police. Now, look. Inspector. Miss Anders, I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Noah Dan. Hi. 
Just to say your brother called on me in my apartment. Your brother, Drake? Yes. But I thought... That well, you thought what? I, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Drake. Now that the formal introductions are over, I'd like to know which one of us is nuts. I heard a shot. I heard two shots. Just a minute, Inspector. Huh? Miss Anders, you can only have one purpose in being in this house. You believe your brother is innocent. Oh, I do. I know he didn't kill Sally. And you hope that if you spend some time here, you'll find something that will substantiate your belief? Yes, there must be something. There must be. Yes, there is, Miss Anders. There's a good deal. It just occurred to me what it is. Inspector, I want you to pay Chief Ebenezer Pringle a visit. Ask him to let us have a copy of the report on the autopsy that was performed on Sally Anders. But wait a minute, Spot. There was a shot. Two shots. A scream. I heard him. You heard him, too. <laughs> Are you going to search the barn, Mr. Drake? Would you rather I didn't, Miss Anders? Why, well, I don't think there could possibly be anything in there. All right, Miss Anders. I think we can skip the barn for the time being and take a look in this lean to But there's nothing in there except odds and ends of farming equipment. And trash barrels, Miss Anders. Trash barrels? Yes. Uh-oh. What in the world are you removing that for? Because I think it will help improving who murdered your brother's wife, Miss Anders. By the way, was it raining on the day Sally Anders was found murdered? Raining? Yes. But I don't know. Wait a minute. No, it wasn't. We had a hard rain the day before. The day before? Are you sure? Yes, I'm positive. Why? Joe's Miss Anders left fine. Come along with me. Inspector Danton will be back in a moment, and we'll... Oh, here comes Emma Beatness, the busy body. I was hoping she wouldn't discover that I was staying here. I don't know what you mean. Miss Beatness seems to be carrying something. The pie... She's forever baking them. It gives her an excuse to call on the neighbors. Oh, Barker! Mm-hmm. I thought you'd like... Oh. Carl Anders. Well, well, I would have thought you'd have the nerve to come back here. And why shouldn't I have the nerve to come back, Emma? Why, she asked. Well, if my brother had murdered his wife... Fred didn't murder Sally. He didn't, I tell you. And don't you dare say he did. Well, I like that. Telling me he didn't do it when I found the body. When I was chief witness at the coroner's inquest. When well, I... your picture was in every newspaper in the country. Have you told Mr. Drake that that picture was taken five years ago? Why, you... I suppose you... at this point it would be appropriate for me to make a noise like a cat. Now, now suppose we go in the house and try one of Miss Venus's pies. I'm sure it would taste better than... I'd I can understand that. You and your brother should know all about poison, Carl Anders. Don't forget it was poison that killed Sally. You're so right. And here comes Inspector Danton with the proof. Hello, Inspector. Did you get the autopsy report? Yeah, I got it. Set up an easy guy was kind of tough. Well, well, if it isn't, Emma the beauty. Don't get fresh, Sandy Danton. What did the autopsy report we do, Inspector Danton? Just what the newspaper said, lady. Sally Anders died of H.C.N. poisoning. H.C.N.? Are you sure, Inspector? Sure, I'm sure. Here it is. Right here. Death due to a dose of HCN poisoning. Traces of a mild sedative also found. I joke, that's the answer. The answer to what? To the identity of the real murderer, Inspector. Miss Anders, may I have your handbag, please? My handbag? Whatever in the world. If you don't no. mind. No, give that back. Inspector. Yeah, I got it. Take it easy, but lady. Go of me. I knew you had something to do with this, Carol Anders. That's what I thought. Miss Anders, have you a permit to carry this gun in your handbag? It isn't any of your business whether I have or not. No, I wasn't nuts. I did hear some shots. And it was this babe who fired That's them. right, Inspector, it was. She fired them to attract our attention, so we'd rush upstairs. Why? What did she want us to rush upstairs for? Tell the Inspector, Miss Anders. You're so clever. You tell him, Mr. Criminologist. I'll be glad to, Miss Anders. There was someone else in the house with you, someone you didn't want us to see. Someone else? Then it must have been... Miss shot her gun and screamed so that we'd rush upstairs and give that other person a chance to escape. Fine thing. So we let the murderer run out from under our noses, eh? You're so clever, Mr. Trent. On the contrary, Inspector. The other occupant of the house didn't escape. Miss Anders made that obvious when she asked me not to search the barn. I didn't know such thing. And so, Inspector, I think it would be a good idea if you stepped over to the barn and placed Mr. Fred Anders under arrest. <laughs> Well, Drake, 
This makes your double cross a hundred percent, doesn't it? Sit down, Andrew. Miss Bemis was just about to cut one of her famous pies. Not for him, I wasn't. Oh, Fred, I'm sorry. Never mind, sir. It was no fault of yours. Well, Drake, go ahead and make a hero out of yourself by sending an innocent man to the chair. I don't intend to send an innocent man to the chair, Andrew. In fact, I don't intend to send a man to the chair at all. What do you mean by that? I mean, Miss Anders, it wasn't a man who murdered Sally Anders. It was a woman. Then it must have been, Carol. She was the only woman mixed up in the ugly business. Wait a minute, Emma, my beauty. You were around, and you're a woman, or you've been overacting. Pretty idea. That's right, Inspector. Emma was around. It was she who administered the poison. See? Oh, how right. dare you say such a thing? Oh, Bart's a great hand at saying dirty things, eh, Bart? Sit still, Petunia. I mean, Emma. Anders, before you left the house on the morning of your wife's murder, did you quarrel with her? Well, well sure, yes. I'm not denying that. What are you quarreling about? Why, uh, what difference does it make? A lot. You'd been having a romance with Emma Bemis, hadn't you? Uh, well, I... Hadn't you? Uh, not really. Emma and I were just... just friendly. Sally was always nagging, and Emma and I... Fred Anders, how dare you imply oh, that stop I... stop asking I... people how they dare things. Keep quiet. You quarreled you? with your wife that morning, Anders, and left in a rage. Emma was outside listening. After a while, she came in and pretended to comfort Mrs. Anders. The two women sat down over a cup of coffee to talk the thing out. Well, of all the outlandish notions... Emma had some HCN poisoning in a vial. Now, HCN is such a bad odor and taste that only a few drops would make any amount of food unpalatable. Well, there. How could I have forced Sally to take any? By first dropping a mild delicate into her coffee, Emma, which made her drowsy. Then, pretending to revive her, you forced more coffee between her lips, coffee that contained HCN poisoning. It's a lie. It's a black lie. Then you took your own cup out to the trash barrel and disposed of it. So it would appear that Sally Anders had been drinking coffee alone. Oh, he didn't. You can't prove it. I you think can. I can prove it, Miss Bemis. It had rained the day before. On the morning of Sally Anders' murder, you worked for a while in your petunia bed. Some of the soil clung to your shoes. You left tracks near the trash bag. Jump and Judas, I got some of that petunia bed soil on my shoes. You are right, Inspector. You have, and we can analyze the contents and prove that... Oh, right, you... I did it. I said he wouldn't marry me because of Sally, even though he hated her. So I studied up on poison. It seemed easy. I didn't think they'd blame Fred. If Drake hadn't known about HCL... <laughs> Well, Bart, here we are back at the Lamplighters Club. Mm -hmm. How about a game of chess? Mm -hmm. No, Inspector. No? What do you mean, no? We always play a game before... Oh, thank you, Jimmy. Hello. Yes, this is Barton Drake. Oh, hello, Miss Vander. Uh-uh. What? <laughs> You've been wondering what aroused my suspicions when Emma told me she peered through the keyhole and saw Sally. Yeah, I'd like to know about that, too. Well... <laughs> It was obvious she was lying, Miss Anders. Did you ever try to peer through the keyhole of a Yale lock? Well, I'll be a... Oh, Sam? Well, that sounds very nice. Uh, 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 uh. I certainly will. You won't. Now, wait a minute, Bart. Don't forget. Be quiet, Inspector. Yeah, but look, I'm only trying to say... Well, thank you, Miss Anders. I know I'll enjoy it. No, you won't. It'll be a bust. Oh, what a pity. He's gone. No, I can't do that. Uh, you see, mystery is my hobby. <laughs> presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable if you can. As you hear the story I call, I Won't Die Alone. Our story begins in 1931. Two young men are speeding along in a car on a lonely West Virginia road at 70 miles an hour. 
There's a tight, tense look on the face of the driver, Steve Martin, as he takes the curves on the road without slowing down. His companion, Chuck Williams, wipes the perspiration from his face with trembling hands. He turns and watches the road behind fearfully, now and then glancing at Steve's face for reassurance. Turn on the radio, Chuck. Let's see if they got an alarm out yet. Yeah, okay. Well, well, what do you think our chances are, Steve? Hard to say. All depends on how fast the cops spread the word. The two men robbed the Third National Bank of Lewisburg of over a quarter of a million dollars shortly before closing time. Word has just been received that the two bank robbers are now driving east on Highway 6B towards the Allegheny Mountains. That's not good. State Police Car 9 take up position at junction of Highway 11A and River Road. They're moving fast. State Police Car 10 take up position at junction of Highway 3 and Highway 6B. Steve, Highway 6B, we're on it. Yeah. That is all. Stand by for further orders. Steve, you got to turn back. We're headed for a trap. Take it easy, will you? There's still a chance. 20 miles ahead, there's a small dirt road that'll detour us right around them. 20 miles? We'll never make it, Steve. Isn't there any other road we can turn off on? No. Are you sure? I was born in these parts. I know every inch of the country. Steve, let's ditch the car and cut towards the mountains on foot. Are you crazy? It's 40 miles to the mountains. We'd never make it walking. We've got to keep driving. It's our only chance. We'll run right into that trap, I tell you. They'll be waiting with Tommy guns. We'll be dead pigeons. Okay, then we'll be dead pigeons. I'd give up my share of the hall right now to be out of this. you got to get me out of this, Steve. you got to. Oh, shut up. Look, Steve, if you were to let me out of the car and keep on going yourself, I might be able to get away. If the cops would be so busy chasing you, I'd be able to give them the slip. You lousy rat. Now, look at it my way, Steve. There ain't no use both are getting caught. That don't make sense. You're great when it comes to sharing the dough, but when the heat's on, you want out. Yeah, but, but uh, I'm willing to pay for uh You can keep my share of the bank on. Now, that's fair enough, ain't it? Huh? A lot of good that don't do me if I get caught, but I'm sick of hearing you whine. All right, it's a deal. If I get through, the dough's all mine. If I don't, well, I don't. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. I'll never forget this. Come on, get out. Hey, uh, which, uh... Which way do I go, Steve? Head across the fields until you hit a small stream. Then head upstream for about six miles. There's a railroad water tower there. You ought to be able to hop a freight. Thanks, Steve. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. So long, Chuck. Show up. See for the paper that got Steve. Yeah. Now let me see that paper. It says here they caught him yesterday afternoon at five. An hour after I left him. But you do run out on him? No, I didn't run out on him. I just played it smart. What are you looking at me like that for? There was no sense in both of us being caught, was there? No, I guess not. Where's the dough? What dough? The 254 grand you got in the bank job. Steve had the dough. What? Look what it says there in the paper. Huh? Go ahead, read it. Martin, when captured, told police he knew nothing about the stolen bank money. Police believe that Martin's unknown companion escaped with the loot. But I didn't fly. I didn't. Steve had that, though, when I left him. Then why didn't the police find it when they caught him? There's only one answer. Steve stopped and hid the dough someplace before they got him. Yeah, that must be it. He's too smart to risk being caught and having all that dough taken away from him. Poor guy. They'll probably throw the book at him. Where have you been so long? Well, what happened at the trial? They give him 25 years. 25 years? Mm -hmm. Uh, how, How did he take it? He didn't bat an eye. Maybe he'll think things over and squeal on Oh, me. stop sniffling, will you? He isn't the kind of a guy to do anything like that. Yeah, sure. Why should he want to squeal on me? Besides, if he did, the cops would find out that I didn't have the bank, though. That it's stable guy. He wouldn't want that to happen. Sure. Well, with good behavior, he'll be out in 18 or 19 years. Then he'll have all that dough head. I'd rather have the 18 or 19 years, not dough. Well... It's been nice knowing you, Chuck. Wait a minute, Flo. Don't go. What? 
Why not stick around? We'd make a good team. We don't need Steve. We don't. Huh? And just what would I get sticking around? You haven't got brain, muscle, or dough. What's the attraction? Listen, Flo, stick with me and I'll get dough. I've always gotten what I wanted in the end. Without Steve, you haven't got a chance. He had all the brains, all the guts. Yeah, and where did it get him? You notice I ain't behind bars. And I'll get that big dough, yes. Three cheers. When you do, look me up. Seventeen years passed. Seventeen years in which earth-shaking events took place. With the passing of time, Steve Martin became just a memory to Chuck Williams and Flo Duval. During the 30s, Chuck struggled desperately to make money in a half dozen petty rackets, but failed miserably. However, with the coming of the war, his luck changed, and in the years that followed, he thrived on the black market. And with his newfound wealth, he was able to win Flo Duval. 1948 found Chuck Williams a happy, prosperous citizen without a care in the world. How many times have I told you to knock before you committed this off? Look, Napoleon, save that big shot stuff for your stooges. <laughs> Same old flow. <laughs> I guess that's what I like about you, baby. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, you've got that superior look on your face again. Who are you planning a knife now? I just got word that our old pal Steve is getting out of prison tomorrow. Steve Martin? The one and only. Been 17 years now. It's a long time. Yeah. I think I'll drive down to the prison. Be there when Steve gets out. What for? You haven't bothered to write or visit him since the day he was sent up? I know. But uh, it's a matter of unfinished business between the two of us. Unfinished business? Yeah. To be exact, 254 grand. You mean you're going after that dough that Steve has stashed away? That's just what I mean. But you gave up your share of that bank dough the day you and Steve separated. I can always change his mind. Chuck, leave Steve alone. That money by rights is his. He paid 17 years for it. Besides, you don't need it. You got more dough than that already. Maybe so, but that isn't going to stop me from getting that 254 grand. And you ought to know by this time I always get what I go after. I got you, didn't I, baby, huh? <laughs> Remember, baby, when those gates open and Steve comes out, let me do the talk. Don't worry, I will. I don't want any part of this, do you? Relax, baby, relax. When I get that 254 G's, I'll buy you a fancy diamond bracelet. Then you'll feel better. Hey, boss, they're opening the gate. Is that him? No. Steve's twice as big as that guy. Chuck, that is Steve. Can't be. That guy looks at least six. You're right. It is Steve. Stay in the car. Hey, Steve. Steve, over here. What's the matter? Don't you remember an old pal? Oh, Chuck. Well, I... I didn't recognize you first. Well, in here, pal. Yeah. I, I guess I'm kind of surprised to see you after all these years. Well, I've been living in South America most of the time. Only got back a year ago. I know I should have written you, but, uh... I never was any good at that. Boy, yeah, sure smells better out here. Come on, come on, let's get in my car. I got a surprise for you. Huh? Surprise? Yeah. You remember Flo Duval, don't you? Well, here she is. Hello, Steve. Hello, Flo. Hey, it's nice seeing you again. <laughs> come on, Steve, get in. We're driving you to town. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, Felix, back to town. Right, boss. You don't look well, Steve. Uh, it's just this prison parlor, Flo, and 17 years. Well, it's all behind you now, Steve. A few weeks of good rest and good food, you'll be a new man. I'd like to believe that. Just take my word for it. I'm never wrong. <laughs> well, you seem to have done all right, Chuck. Yeah, not bad. I own a nightclub, a bowling alley, used car business, a couple of apartment houses. I can't complain. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm not forgetting an old pal, either. Now, Flo and me want you to come and stay with us until you get on your feet. You know, a house guest. No, uh, I'd rather not, Chuck. I don't want to put you out. Put me out? Ha! Huh. Listen to the guy. Well, we got sweet servants, everything. Steve, I just won't take no for an answer. A week passed, then two weeks, 
during which Steve Martin did little other than eat and sleep and take long walks. Chuck Williams played the role of the gracious host of perfection, and his guests lacked nothing in the way of comfort. So concerned was Chuck with his guests' welfare that he always knew exactly where Steve was and uh, what he was doing. Then one day, as Chuck had known it would happen, Steve came into his office for a private chat. Are you busy, Chuck? No, no. Have a seat, Steve. Thanks. What's on your mind? Well, uh... While I was doing time, my old man died and left me a small farm in West Virginia. That's where I was born and raised, you know. Yeah, I remember you telling me. Well, uh, I'm going back to the old farmhouse and settle down there for a while. I see. Well, anything you say, Steve. Only let's keep in touch, huh? Yeah, sure thing, Chuck. When are you thinking of leaving? Tomorrow morning. Well, that's soon, huh? Well, we'll have to have a little farewell party tonight, okay? Yeah, fine. I'll see you later. Right you are. Felix, come in here. What's up, boss? My pal, Steve, getting ready to make his move. Guess he can't wait no longer to get his hands on that dough. Looks that way. He's leaving tomorrow morning for a small farm he's got in West Virginia. West Virginia, huh? Yeah. Farmhouse can't be more than 30 or 40 miles from where he stashed the dough. Is there any chance he might have hidden it on the farm? Nah. Cops caught him before he got that far. He hid that dough someplace off Highway 6B. How many of the boys you want me to take along? Take four. I don't want any slip-ups. Watch him day and night, and without being seen. Just leave it to me. Sooner or later, he'll lead you to the dough. When he, when he does, well, you know what to do. Yeah. Okay, then. You better start packing. The next morning, when Steve Martin took a train for West Virginia, two very inconspicuous men were seated at the other end of the coach he was riding in. They watched him get off the train at an all but deserted station in West Virginia and made no move to follow him. As the train started off, Steve hired a car to take him to the farm he'd inherited. And it was dusk when he finally reached the deserted farmhouse. On a heavily wooded hill a hundred yards away, Felix and a companion watched through field glasses as Steve lit a fire in the farmhouse and prepared to settle down for the night. In the days and nights that followed, Felix and his men took turns watching Steve Martin's every action. And every evening, Felix would phone Chuck Williams and report that Steve hadn't made a move as yet. How many times have I told you to knock before coming into this office? What's the matter, Napoleon? Are things working out? I told you to lay off that Napoleon stuff. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. It must be Felix. Hello? Hello, uh, boss. Felix. Well, what's happening? Nothing. He still hasn't made a move. All he does is fish and read. What about visitors? He hasn't seen anyone since the day he got here. Are you sure he didn't give me the slip during the night and get the dough? Not a chance. I got two boys watching the house at night. Well, maybe he knows he's being watched, and that's why he hasn't tried anything. I bet my last buck he hasn't spotted us. Uh, nothing ever goes right unless I'm running the show. I'm leaving tonight for West Virginia. I'll see you in the morning. Okay, boss. I'll be expecting you. <laughs> It's a farmhouse down there, boss. Look through the field glasses. You can see it just like you were standing in the front yard. He's sitting on the porch reading. Yeah, reading and fishing is all he does. He hasn't been more than a couple of hundred yards away from the house since he got here. Well, he must have spotted you. That must be the reason he hasn't made a move. How could he have spotted us? You can see how careful we've been. Well, I'll wait a couple more days. See what happens. He doesn't move soon. I'll have to think of something else. Leaving Felix to continue his watch over the farmhouse, Chuck returned to the village and registered at the village inn. The hours that followed dragged interminably, and the hatred that Chuck felt for Steve Martin grew with each passing hour. In the evening, Felix drove into the village and reported that nothing new had occurred. Four more fruitless days went by. Chuck Williams was unable to contain his fury any longer. He got into his car and drove to within a half mile of the farmhouse, then walked the rest of the way to where Felix and his men were hidden on the hill. Boss, what are you doing here? I got tired of waiting. 
You better get down, boss. It's Steve Martin's liable to spot you. Forget that. We're through playing a waiting game. We're going to move in on him. Move in on yeah. him? Yeah. Maybe after a light workout, my pal Steve will be willing to tell me where he stashed the dough. Ah, that sounds more like it. I never did go for this cat and mouse game. Before we're through with him, he'll be begging to tell us what he knows. <laughs> Steve, got lonesome for you. Decided to pay your call. I thought you'd get around to it sooner or later. You don't sound very glad to see me. That's a fine way to act towards a pal who was your host for the last three weeks. Didn't I treat you right? Yeah. That's what made me figure I hadn't seen the last of you. What do you want? I'll give you one guess. I haven't got it. I know you haven't, but you know where it is. So what? That money belongs to me, not you. That's where you're wrong, pal. That though belongs to the guy strong enough to get it. That's me. Okay, then you go ahead and get it. Should I let him have it, boss? That's not up to me, Felix. That's up to Steve. Well, pal, you gonna dig up that dough for me? No. You're not as smart as you used to be. You know I'll get what I want in the end. I wouldn't count on it. Okay, Felix, I guess it's up to you and Slim now. Don't talk. Won't you, pal? That's it, pal. Uh, try getting on your feet. Here, let me help you. How is he, Felix? It's out cold, boss. He always did have a stepping stick. You think in his condition he couldn't take all that punishment? If we give him any more, he's liable to kick off. Sure? Yeah. He's already got a couple of busted ribs, and that beating around the head didn't help him. We gotta make him talk. We gotta. We have to figure out some other way. Throw some water in his face. Okay. Let's come too, boss. Wrap him up in a chair. Come on, you. There. Steve, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Felix here wants to try the water treatment. Water treatment? Yeah. Now, why don't you play it smart and tell me where you hit that dough? Don't talk, huh? Okay, Felix. Wait, wait, I'll talk. Well, it's more like it. Where is it? You could never find it alone. Uh, I'll have to take you to it. Just you and me. What's the matter with Felix coming along? Just you and me. Okay, pal, okay. Only I'm wondering if you're in condition to make it. Hey, Felix. Yeah, boys. Give him a few drinks, try to fix him up. Right. As soon as you've done that, Steve and me will be on our way. An hour later, Steve, with the assistance of Felix, tottered to Chuck Williams' car and got in the front seat. Chuck slid behind the wheel and started the motor. As he drove off, he waved to Felix triumphantly. In a few minutes, the farmhouse had faded from view. Steve huddled in a corner of the front seat fought to keep from crying out every time the car hit a rut in the road. Now and then, he opened his pain-filled eyes to look out the window. Chuck watched him with satisfaction as he drove. How much farther is it? You drive about five miles until you reach a small gravel road where you'll see a big sign saying the Devil's Caverns. Uh, you turn right there and go two miles. The Devil's Caverns? What are they? They're a big tourist attraction in these parts during the summer. Hundreds of huge underground caverns that run for miles in all directions. You mean that's where you stashed the dough? Yeah. The best place in the world. How do you know you'll be able to find it again? I know every inch of the caverns. When I was a kid, my old man worked as a tourist guide there. I learned my way around from him. Okay. But you better find that dough. I'm warning you. I'll find it. Well, you should be reaching the gravel road in a couple of minutes. Turn right, then it's two miles to the Devil's Caverns. <laughs> This is it. Park the car in that shed over there. Place sure looks deserted. Well, no one ever comes here until June. Is that the entrance to the cabin? That door set in the rock? Yeah. You'll have to shoot the lock off the door. Is this okay? Yeah. No one will ever be able to spot the car here. But you said no one comes here until June. No one does. I take chances. We'll need a flashlight. I got one. 
Come out this way. If you're thinking of any tricks, don't. Remember, I got this gun, and you're in no condition to try anything. You, you, you saw to that. How come you didn't hide out here when the cops were after you? Well, there wasn't any place to hide the car. Shed wasn't here 17 years ago. Tough. And it's still such a lonely-looking place. Yeah. Well, you ought to be able to blow this padlock off at one shot. You better stand over there. That does it. How much further is it? Seems like we've been walking an hour already. It's right up ahead. You sure you can find your way out again? All these cabins look alike to me. Yeah, I know the way out. Sure is damp in here. Hey, what was that? Oh, probably just a rat running past you. Place is full of them. Seems to me it's taken a long time to find that place where you hid the dough. If you're trying anything, Here's I'll... where it is. I'll hold the flashlight a little higher. That's it. I hit the suitcase behind this rock. Got it? No, not yet. Here it is. Yeah, that's it. That's it, all right. I can still recognize it. Open it up. Well, there's a dough. Yeah. Still in the bank rafters. Look at it. Over a quarter of a million bucks. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> Answer me. The other guy always gets what he goes after in the end, huh? Yeah. <laughs> now I got the dough. And I'm asking you again, what's so funny? <laughs> look at the money. Go ahead, look at it. I'm looking. What about it? Yeah, you're looking, mastermind, but you don't see. All those bills are goldbacks. Goldbacks? Yeah, that's right. In 1933, the government called in all goldbacks. That's how the kidnapper, Bruno Hoffman, got caught. Trying to pass goldbacks after the government had called him in. I mean, that dough is no good? That's just what I mean. You try passing any of that dough and you'll end up doing time. And you've known all along that dough was no good? Ever since 1933. Knowing it was worthless, I never intended coming here for it. But you may. I'm going to let you have it, you rat, for leading me on like this. Well, why don't you? Come on, pick up that suitcase. Let's get out of here. Oh, uh, wait a minute. I forgot to tell you, Chuck. Tell me what? I'm staying here. You're staying here? Yeah. That's right. Now, look, they've had enough out of you. I start leading the way out. I guess you didn't understand. I said I'm staying here. Get gone or you'll get it right between the eyes. <laughs> that doesn't scare me. You see, Chuck, there was something else I didn't tell you. Something else? Yeah. I didn't get out of prison on good behavior. I got out because the doctor said I was going to die in three months. You're going to die in three months? Yeah, that's right. I thought I'd die peacefully on my farm. Only you wouldn't let me do that. So I've decided to die here. With you, as company. Steve, you can't do that. You can't do that, Steve. you got to get me out of here. you got to. I don't have to do anything I don't want to. Get me out of here, Steve. I'll make it worth your while. I got dough. I got lots of dough. It's too bad you won't be able to take it with you. Steve, I'll give you a hundred G's. Two hundred G's if you get me out of here. Not going to be tough for me to die. Because I only got three months anyway. But I'm going to enjoy watching you. You're going to get weaker and weaker as you plead with me to lead you out of here. Then you're going to get desperate and try to find a way out by yourself. But you'll never make it. You'll go wandering from one cabin to another, and then in the end, you'll probably wander back here to find me dead. And your flashlight's gonna go out. Huh? You'll be all alone in the dark with the rats and the bats. Well, stop it! Stop it, or I'll shoot! You'll so weak, and the rats are gonna close in on you before you know. Steve. Steve. I didn't mean it. But you made me. Steve. Say something. The 
visit the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? What happened to Chuck Williams? Oh, the poor fellow was found dead a month later when the cabins were open for the summer tourist trade. Seems Chuck had wandered from cabin to cabin without being able to find his way out. Evidently, he'd gone mad in his last hours before he was found with his pockets stuffed full of bills. Uh, gold racks. Now, I recall another case in which two ghosts came face to face only to discover that... Oh, you have to get off now. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's story, all characters were fictional, and any resemblance to the name of an actual person, living or dead, was purely coincidental. In the cast were Maurice Tarplin, Joe Julian, Art Carney, Elspeth Eric, and Alan Manson. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Robert J. Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Death Writes a Letter. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. Don't miss the chilling tale titled Seven Casks of Death, written by Maurice Tarplin, your mysterious traveler, which appears in the current issue of Dime Mystery Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. This program has come to you from New York. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Baron Frankenstein is taking shelter in the good ship Voyager, where he is the guest of Captain Walton. While the Voyager was icebound, Frankenstein told the captain some of his tragic story. He told of the creation of the monster, of its escape and return. I thought that you had a refreshing sleep, Baron Frankenstein. You certainly look much better this morning. Thank you, Captain. I slept very well, and I feel that my strength is gradually returning. I am glad to hear that. Do you feel inclined to tell me some more of your story? Well, I remember telling you how the monster had returned. He had learned to speak, and he begged me to make him a mate. Yes. One cannot help feeling a little sorry for him. I know what it is to be bitterly lonely. I also know. But the monster rushed out of the house when I refused. My wife and I discussed the matter. I sent for the burgomaster and begged that his officers would look for the monster. Some little time later, the storm burst in all its fury. The rain came down in torrents and the thunder roared. My wife approached me and... Victor, do you know that Justine has not brought little William home yet? I have almost forgotten about them, Elizabeth. Are you sure they have not come home? I have searched the house. I have asked the other servants. There have been no sign of them. Dear, this is most disturbing. You instructed the woman to come home before the storm burst. They have been out for a long time. 
Do you think we should go and look for them? And they only went to the edge of the lake. They cannot be far away. I am far away, sir. You know the monster is loose out there. Suppose that he were to attack William or Justin. Oh, there is no fear of that. Undoubtedly, Justin and William are kicking shelter from there. I hope that you are right. But Justin, you have returned. Where is William? How can I tell you? Good girl. Where is William? I took him to the lake. There was playing with him there. He ran away from me. He went into the woods. Oh, I took a long time to find him, but I failed. I called his name time and time again, but there was no reply. Stormed I became panic stricken. I have been out in the rain searching for him. I fear that he may have fallen into the lake. Victor, you must go at once. Find the burgomaster and his men. Tell them to forget about the monster. They must find William. I will go now. Have open courage, Elizabeth. I am sure that I will find William somewhere. Madam, how can I ask your forgiveness? I swear that I meant no harm to come to the sky. You should have stayed with him, Justin. If any harm has come to me, I will never forgive myself. Well, go and change your clothes. You are very full, and then come down here. We will wait patiently for Baron Frankenstein to return. Ah, Victor, you have not gone yet. I am taking some of the servants with me. I have left word uh, here that if the Volgamaster and his men return, they are to look for William. Wait for me, Elizabeth. I will return as soon as possible. Well, Baron Frankenstein, did you succeed in finding the child? Well, for two hours I searched, taking my faithful servant with me. We wandered through the woods, calling the child's name, but there was no reply. At last, somewhat dispirited, I returned home to find my wife and Justine waiting for me. As soon as I entered. Victor, is there any news? Did you see any sign of him? Not a sign. He must have fallen into the lake. And it was my fault. Victor, I am distracted. What can have become of William? I do not know, my dear. Did the burgomaster return? He has not been back yet. The storm is abating. Yeah, it is passing. We will continue our search all through the night. Yes. I hear men voices. So the burgomaster is returning. Bring him in here, Justine. As you command, Baron Frankenstein. Oh, I blame myself for this in a way. Victor, we should never have allowed Justine to take William out today. She should have taken better care of him. She should never have allowed him to stay out of her sight. <laughs> a woman screamed. Victor. What can it mean? Burgomaster, what has happened? Who screamed? I am calling to tell you, Baron Frankenstein, that a tragedy has occurred. <gasps> My men have found the body of the child, William. William? He's dead? Yeah. The girl just seized on his body when we were carrying it in. My men are all the Elizabeth, I do not know what to say to you. Burgomaster, tell us what has happened. I only know that we were searching for this monster of whom Baron Frankenstein spoke. During the course of our search, we looked through some rushes on the edge of the lake, and there we found the body of the boy, William. Oh. He was lying face downward in shallow water, and he was dead oh. when we found him. Did you send for a doctor? Yeah, we did, but a doctor could not have helped in this case, Baron Frankenstein. Do you think the boy tripped and fell into the water? I think that he was pushed into the water. Oh. And I think Justine was responsible for the crime. Oh, no. You must not say that. You have been away, both of you. But it is common talk here that Justine disliked the boy. She was always scolding him. And she told people that he was a difficult child. And we think that in a fit of rage, she pushed him into the water. Oh, I do not think that is possible. Well, let us have the girl in here and question her now. But my wife is grief-stricken. She needs us to remain here. Let me go and look about the body of William. I will send Justine to you. Very well, my dear. But do not distress yourself. Please go to your room and rest. I feel that I shall never be able to rest peacefully again. I will wait here with the burgomaster. Tell them to bring Justine in here. I know this is most distressing for you, Baron Frankenstein. But I have my duty to do. And if my suspicions are correct, then Justine will be arrested. Tell me this. Did you see any sign of the monster? Any huge footprints? No, we did not. The rain was coming down in torrents. No footprints would be left. Oh, bring Justine in here. 
But why have these men seized me? I have committed no crime. Hear me, girl. Is it not true that you were always scolding the child? He was a baby child. And as he was in my charge, I had to correct his fault. You are a woman of unbridled temper. And at times you have been known to strike the child. Why, this is news to me, Borgomaster. She has been seen to strike the child. That is not true. That is true. Will you admit that at times you have struck him? Yes, I have struck him. But merely because we deserved it. You have no right to do that. Hear me, Justine. Is it not true that in a bit of rage you pushed the child into the lake? That is untrue. I swear I did not push him into the lake. He ran away from me. He went into the woods and I could not find him. You must believe me. Now we do not believe you. Baron Frankenstein, you know I would not kill the child. I direct your remarks to me, Justine. Is it not true that in a bit of rage you pushed the child into the lake? And then you were afraid of your mad act. You wandered around in the rain for hours and pretended you were looking for it. It is not true. Did you quarrel with him today? I was angry with him for running away from me. And I said I would slap him if I caught him. You terrified the child. I did not kill him. I am going to arrest you and charge you with the murder. You will stand your trial in due time. Down, Frankenstein, I appeal to you. I swear that the child came to no harm at my hand. I have served your family faithfully and well these many years. I did not murder William. You cannot believe it of me. I beg that you do not allow him to arrest me. Burger Master, I think you are being rather hasty. I cannot believe that Justine pushed the child into the lake. It is my duty to arrest criminals. And I suspect her of having committed a murder. You are a stupid man. There is no proof that I did it. Uh, we will find proof. What has happened? Oh, Elizabeth, you have returned. I felt I wanted to know what was happening here. And I thought that you should go and look on the body of William. Justine has been arrested. The burgomaster thinks that she killed William. Baroness, save me. Do not let them arrest me. I did not kill the child. You believe me. You must believe me. Burgomaster, why did you say that Justine killed the child? Who else would have done it? Wait here. I wish to go and look on the body of the child. Do not take Justine away until I speak with you again. Very well. We will wait for you, Baron Franklin. I will return in a few minutes. Now, Dorothy, it will be better for you if you tell the truth. If you confess, then there may be a chance of saving your life. But if you persist in your denial and the court finds you guilty, then you will surely die. But I am not guilty. And I know the Baroness does not believe that I am guilty. Perhaps the Baroness is not aware that at times you struck the child. Is that true, Justine? I had to correct his faults. Never at any time did I strike him hard. Oh, you had no right to strike him. I go to my knees before you, Baroness. I swear I am innocent of this charge. Please help me. Enough of that, Justine. You shall receive a fair trial. But I am convinced that you are guilty. Hey, Uncle Master. This girl is not to be taken from the house. What ails you, Baron Frankenstein? She did not murder the child. What? How do you know? Did you not observe the marks upon the child's throat? She was strangled. The marks were the same as those upon the throat of my poor servant, Julio. I am in reality the murderer of that child. Baron Frankenstein, what tragedy you have faced. Well, even now, when I think of it, I feel that I loathe that devil. But I cannot die yet. Will you tell me some more of the story? Not now. Let me just rest for a while. Come to me later, and you shall hear further details of my tragic life.
Unsolved Mysteries. In the realms of unsolved mysteries, nothing is more baffling than the disappearance of a human being. This is a true unsolved mystery of the disappearance of a prominent man. The case aroused international interest, and as the years pass, the mystery deepens. fashionable home in the exclusive quarter of one of America's largest cities. The night, beautiful with the sprinkled stars just beginning to show against a sky of black velvet, and falling away from the house, rows and rows of electric lights stretch out like jeweled fingers to reach the city. Two men and a woman rise from the dinner table and move out into a glassed-in veranda as a servant brings coffee. Awfully glad, Judge, that you were able to drop over for dinner. Yes, indeed. Harry has spoken so many times of having you over, but, well, you, you've been so busy. Yes. Most people think that a judge's day's work is over when he rises from the bench. But, you know, if you take your work seriously and conscientiously, you spend hours going over the day's testimony. Oh, it's been worth it, though, Judge. You've been mighty successful. I suppose so. In fact, I, I might as well say yes. I set out to study law with the intention of rising to the Supreme Court. And, and now you're on the superior bench. And headed for your goal. Ah, and you're still a young man. Handling the criminal cases you do, Judge, aren't you sometimes afraid that some of these criminals will be revenged on you? Oh, I've been threatened, but then so has every other judge, I suppose. But not afraid, eh? No, I'm not afraid. Although, I must admit that sometimes, when I think of my wife, some of the men I've put away for 10 or 15 years, I, I wonder what they might try to do when their terms are up. Oh, I say, I... I hate frightfully to eat and run, but I have quite a bit of work to do tonight. Uh, will you excuse me? Of course. Don't mention it. It's been grand having you over. Uh, I'll call a taxi. My car's being repaired. Oh, please don't bother. It's quite a short walk. Good for me. I'd really much rather walk. Well, uh, if you're sure you'd rather... Yes, really. Well, once again, uh, we've enjoyed having you. Uh, good night, Judge. Sure you won't change your mind about the taxi? No. In any case, I can find a cab, but it won't take me more than ten minutes to walk home. But the judge never got home. He stepped off briskly down the street, and as if the earth opened and swallowed him, he disappeared. Several hours later at the judge's home, a detective inspector and the police searched the house while the deputy district attorney questions the servants. You say that the judge went out for dinner? Said he'd be back before nine? Uh, Oui, monsieur. Uh, That is what he said to me. He told me, sir, that I needn't stay in if I wanted to go to a movie or anything. Who'd he have dinner with? Mr. and Mrs. Howard. You called them? I called them, monsieur, while uh, Robin, the, the butler, monsieur, phoned you. Yes? what they say? Mm, they say as soon as they put their little girl to bed, they will come over here. Good. Any threatening phone calls? And none the diner wops, sir. You? Not me, monsieur. I know of nothing. Oh, more than likely that's Mr. and Mrs. Howard now, sir. Bring them in. Uh, yes, sir. Found anything yet, Inspector? Not so far, dear. You can go. Unless you've anything to add. No, monsieur. I don't know a thing, monsieur. All right, run along. But stay where I can find you. Oh, uh, I just know something terrible has happened, monsieur. Eh? Why? It's just a feeling, monsieur. I cannot help it, monsieur. I know he has been killed. The district attorney's in the line. Why, this is awful, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stewart. To think that he should have dinner at our house and, and then... Did he show any signs of fear when he was dining with you? No. Oh, we did discuss the fact that he'd been threatened. 
Uh, but he said he wasn't afraid. You watched him leave the house? Yes. We watched him walk down the street until he turned the corner. You watched him too? Yes. No suggestions to offer? I'm sorry. Not a thing. Nor I, I'm afraid. Well, uh, thanks very much for coming over. Let the sergeant in the door know where we can find you if we need you. And again, thanks. Good night. Good day. Come out, Eddie, eh? Right with you. Servant's gone out of the room? Yeah. What's in the wind? Look here. Checkbook stubs. Bank notices. Hmm. Figure them out? Yeah. The last few weeks he's withdrawn from deposit better than $22,000. That could mean a lot of things. Yes, including blackmail. What's in the strong box? Not a thing. Empty. Was it locked? No, it was open all that. No incriminating letters? Not a one. I just searched the house. All these clothes are there as far as I can tell. At least there's no signs of packing up to leave. All the coat hangers, pants hangers too, filled. Shaving kit, hairbrushes in the bathroom? Yes, sir. Suitcases and trunks all empty and in the closet. You walked this beat, didn't you? Yes, sir. You didn't see the judge come home? No, sir. So he disappeared between the corner of Laurel and the house here. That's right. No suspicious characters around? No, sir. Fact is, I haven't seen half a dozen people in the neighborhood all evening. Well, we'd better get down to headquarters and start some real searching. But all the searching availed nothing. The police dragnet was thrown out. The underworld of America was combed. Stool pigeons were questioned. The search spread to Mexico, to Cuba, Europe... Fine Judge Draper. Uh, Fine Judge Draper. London calling. Call from America. Fine Judge Draper. Fine Judge Draper. Fine Judge Draper. Je suis Monsieur le Judge Draper. Ah, uh, yeah. This is Berlin. We are searching for Judge Draper. Moscow answering. Searching for Judge Draper. All the police of the world in the daily press, private investigators, private citizens joined in the search for the missing jurist. Not a murmur. Not a word that would lead to his discovery. Within a period of 24 hours, the judge was reported seen in Havana, Italy, Arizona, New Mexico, Los Angeles, and Canada. But inquiries met with blank walls in every direction. Thousands of people were questioned, and month after month, the search went on. One night, five months later, the district attorney and the inspector stand in the missing judge's study talking to his wife. You say that you came home, opened this strong box, and found these? Uh, Yes, Mr. Stewart. Hmm. You looked in the box before? No, because you had already searched it and found nothing. We did search it. It was empty. Couldn't possibly have been any papers in there without us finding them. Six thousand, ten, twenty, seventy-five thousand in securities. And a lot of papers in the judge's handwriting. This convinces me that the judge must be alive. That doesn't convince me. Not the way we've searched. How could anyone escape our search? Five years of searching. $300,000 $300,000 worth of searching, and still no signs of the missing jurist. Wireless, radio, telephone, cable, photographs, rewards, a network of communication burning hot with inquiry without response. And today, six years later, the disappearance of Superior Court Judge Draper is still an unsolved mystery. Out of deference to people who may still be living, character names in some of these unsolved mysteries have been changed. Inasmuch as any solution must of necessity be supposition, liberties of time, place, and characters have been taken. In just a moment, you will hear a solution to the Judge Draper mystery. We'll be back with the conclusion of this unsolved mystery right after this short break. And now, let's get back to our Unsolved Mystery on When Radio Was.
Ladies and gentlemen, the solution for which you have been waiting. The scene is the apartment of an underworld character. He sits behind his desk giving orders to his two henchmen, one dressed in evening clothes, the other in the livery of a chauffeur. Now, listen, you two. I tried to get the judge to listen to reason, but he nixed me before I even got started. So, he's going to send Joe up, eh? Maybe. What do you mean, maybe? He ain't going to send any more up. He's through. You mean you're going to snatch him? I'm going to do more than snatch him. I'm going to take him for a hundred grand. Now, listen. Okay, shoot. Draper has about 70,000 in securities in his library. He's got about 25,000 in cash in his safe. How do you know? Never mind how I know. I do, and that's enough for you. Tonight, he's dining out with friends. The servants have been given the night off, if they want it. But we don't care. They'll all be in the back of the house eating. You, Red, won't have any difficulty with a strong box or the desk. Okay. You pull that about a quarter of seven. And then you jump into the car and cruise around till the judge starts home. I've got Ike planted with a taxi. But the judge has been walking lately, and it's only a ten-minute walk home, so more than likely he'll walk. And Bill will drive me past, and I'll sign him over to the car. That's the dope. If he shows ugly... I don't care what he shows. I want that buzzard in here before night. It's all right. But don't forget, it'll search. The whole city will be torn apart. Let him search. Where I'm going to put him, there ain't nobody will ever find him. To this day, the only word out of the vast unknown that has brought any hint of what might have happened are two letters. The first, signed S.S., is quoted... Joe Draper is dead. No use looking for him. He was buried August 22nd, after being in the water two weeks. Sorry, I can't tell where, but it's true. And signed, S.S. Another letter to much the same effect was postmarked Buffalo. But from the moment of his disappearance, six years ago till today, no one in whose identification reliance can be placed has set eyes on the missing jurist. Contrary to the belief that the returned securities were an indication that the judge was still alive, the returned papers may indicate the possibility that gangsters could not dispose of them and returned them to the strong box, hoping the police would be led to assume that Judge Draper was still alive. And its 60,000 dealers and service stations present The Spin. Tonight, Autolite brings you the Academy Award nominee, Miss Jane Wyman, in a dramatization of the outstanding mystery novel, Catch Me If You Can. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leader. Have you actually tried them? Those dandies, those dillies, down the dales, and up the hillies, wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs? Well, buy Cornelius do. Prove to yourself that wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs actually make your car idle smoother, give you better performance with leaner gas mixtures, save you gas dollars, and cut down interference with radio and television reception. My, oh, my, if you want to see a satisfied, smiling guy, switch to auto light resistor spark plugs. Only the Autolite Company offers car and truck owners everywhere their sensational advantages. So head for your nearest Autolite dealer and replace old narrow gap spark plugs with wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, be right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Jane Wyman 
in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Let me tell you. Let me talk as long as I can. It's my last chance to explain about Phil and all the trouble I had afterwards. Phil got me into this mess the night he died. I sat near his bed, waiting for him to fall asleep, and he said, Marco, was there anything in that milk you gave me tonight? Well, of course, darling. Dr. Landers prescribed it. A sedative. Oh? You're a beautiful woman, Marco. Very beautiful. Yes. He was taking so long to fall asleep. It was already after three in the morning. I listened to the wind. Phil and I were all alone, stuck in that godforsaken mountain inn. Ever since he fell ill just before Labor Day. There we were, 10,000 feet above sea level. Not a soul for miles. The fall season was over and all the other guests were gone. And even Joe, who owns the inn, had gone down to Leadfield to get his winter supplies. Oh, I shivered thinking of the dark, ragged, lonesome mountains outside. And Phil opened his eyes again. You're a good actress, Margo. Better off the stage than you were on, I expect. But I know you're fed up with our marriage. Have been ever since I became ill. I haven't complained, Phil. No, it wouldn't fit the part. But you feel trapped out here in Colorado, don't you? You'd rather be in New York. I wonder, Margo. Those pills you put on my lunch tray last week, they weren't my regular vitamin pills. Maybe you want your freedom and my money enough to poison me. Don't be ridiculous, Phil. Well, anyway, I didn't take them. I hid them (gasps) with a note saying that you tried to give them to me. Then I called a friend of mine long distance, an old friend. Who? A detective named Rocky Rhodes. Rocky and I both stayed at this inn one summer. And what did you tell this Rocky? Never mind what I told him. Just remember, he's due here tonight or in the morning. A detective? Phil, you're a fool. I want a divorce, Margot. You do? Yes, without any strings. Those pills are Exhibit A, if they're poison. Blackmail. Phil, darling, if you want a divorce... You can have it without threatening me. You'll sign the papers tomorrow? Of course, darling. I only want to make you happy. But now go to sleep, Phil. You need a good rest. Go to sleep. I stroked his forehead as the sedatives finally took effect. His breathing became very heavy and even. I looked at him and thought he was smart not to take those pills. Ah, but not smart enough. He shouldn't have told me about that detective. He thought he was protecting himself, and that I wouldn't dare do anything now. Oh, but he was wrong, because I had to now. I couldn't afford to wait and lose everything when he divorced me. And besides, I'd find those pills in the letter before the detective got here. There was practically no risk the way I'd planned it this time. Outside, it had started to rain. A heavy downpour. And the only other sound in the world was Phil's breathing. I picked up the extra pillow and put it down carefully. Carefully over his face. He didn't move. I pressed the pillow down on the side so that no air could get in. No air at all. I held it there a long time. Once the pillow shook a little when Phil's head moved. And once there was a gurgling sound. And that was all. When I lifted the pillow and took it back in its place, the job was done. Everything I ever wanted. Money and freedom was right in my hands. Phil was dead. Dead of a heart attack, Dr. Landers would say. Oh, but wait a minute. Unless someone found those pills with a note from Phil. Phil hadn't died of poison, so I was safe. But there would be questions. Questions I didn't want to have asked. I had to find those pills myself. I started to search. First, the pillow under Phil's no. Then the nightstand beside his bed. And the desk under the window. No. Where could he have hidden it? After all, the bell. Could it be Phil's detective already? Rocky? Rocky Rhodes? I'll have to be very careful. Just a minute. I'm coming. Just a minute. Well, don't stand there. It's raining in. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I'm lost. I'm looking for Pineview Lodge. Well, you are lost. There's a fisherman's net. Yes, I know. I saw the sign. It's uh, it's closed for the winter. Well, could you put me up? The manager's away. There's only me and my husband. 
So the luck of the Irish. I meet a beautiful blonde and she's married every time. You wouldn't turn me out in this storm. I'm soaking wet. I'm afraid oh, I... please, just tonight. In the morning, I'll get my bearings. Well, if it's, if it's only for one night... Yes, that's all. Thank you. Oh, what a vacation. Where are you from? Chicago, newspaper man. My name is Mike Sheldon. How do you do, Mr. Sheldon? I'm Mrs. Weatherby. How do you do? Uh, where do I bunk? Upstairs? Yes, you can take the trout room. Every room is named for a different kind of fish. It's the second room on the right from the top of the stairs. Thank you. Great of you to let me stay. Would you like some hot coffee? Fine. No trouble. Well, not at all. I was going to make some for myself. I can use some, all right. No! No, wait! What? No, not that room! No! What's wrong, Mrs. Weatherby? Well, I, I said I said the second door on the right. The salmon room, not the trout room. I made a mistake. Forgive me, but this is my husband's room and he's not well. I was afraid you'd wake him up. Oh, it's bad. Very bad. Making a slip like that in front of Phil's detective Rocky Rhodes. Because, of course, Mike Sheldon was Rocky Rhodes. Who else could he be? And I had to find those pills before he did and started making trouble. Before I could get back to the search, two more unexpected guests popped in at Fisherman's Net. A small, dapper man with a black mustache and slick black hair. But I'm Charlie Miller. I got a reservation here, and I'm staying, sister. But the manager is away. He didn't mention any reservation. Well, he must have forgot then. I made it by telephone from KC. That is, I mean, I asked a friend of mine to make it. <laughs> Was it Phil? Was Charlie Miller Rocky Rhodes? Oh, he couldn't be a detective. He was too stupid. No, no, Mike Sheldon was Rocky Rhodes. There was a girl with Charlie Miller. I thought she was Mrs. Miller. No, I'm Susan Quinn. Mr. Miller and I met on the bus. Yeah, and we were great pals right off. I, I call her Susie Q. You get it? Yes. <laughs> but the initials on your suitcase are SR, Miss Quinn. Oh, well, I borrowed my sister Sheila's suitcase. Sheila Riley. She's married. Sheila and I always borrow each other's things. Was it true? Or was her name Susan Rhodes, nicknamed Rocky Rhodes? Things are getting more complicated every minute. Two men had arrived, and Sheldon seemed most like a detective. It was too late for me then to go on hunting for the pills. It was morning. In case questions were asked later, I had to be able to say I had done what a wife with a sick husband ought to do. I had to take Phil his breakfast on a tray. Well, Mrs. W., hey, you're an early bird. Here, let me help you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Miller. This is my husband's breakfast. If you'll open the door. Sure thing. There you are. Thank you. Phil. Phil, dear, I brought you... <gasps> Something wrong, Mrs. W? My husband. He looked. He looked. Uh, well, anything I can do? Say. Oh. Uh, he does look pretty green at that. Mr. Weatherby. Hey, Mr. What? Oh. You, you better sit down, Mrs. Weatherby. It uh, looks to me like your husband has passed away. Oh, no. No, no, no. Here, now. Sit down. All right, now you just cry on Uncle Charlie's shoulder. Do you good. You're, you're very kind. Well, good morning. Oh, say, uh, Sheldon, uh, got a little trouble here. Trouble? Mrs. Weatherby? Well, her husband's passed away in his sleep, <laughs> looks like. I brought his breakfast. I thought he was asleep. And... Will, he, will somebody phone Phil's doctor? Dr. Landers and Salisbury Gap. Well, of course, but... Uh... Hey, excuse me, I'm a... I'm afraid I'd better go to my room. <laughs> Oh, Miss Quinn. What happened? Have I been asleep? Well, when you got to your room, you fainted. I still feel rather faint. I brought you some brandy. Could you drink a little? Not now. I couldn't. Where's Mr. Miller and Mr. Sheldon? They're moving your husband's body. No, they mustn't. Well, Dr. Landers told Mike to on the phone. The rain turned to snow during the night, and you won't be able to get here because of the storm. Not until the snow thaw gets through. So he thought it best we put Mr. Weatherby. Not outdoors. No. There's a hillside cellar out back. Oh, yes. What else did Dr. Landers say about Phil? He said 
It must have been a heart attack. Oh. And that you have nothing in the world with which to reproach yourself. Be sure you did everything you could. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Jane Wyman in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. That stack of Valentine. Yeah, quite a pile, child. In fact, blocks will come. No, they're not for me. They're Valentine's to Autolite Resistor Spark Plug. Oh. Listen to this one. You've won my heart with your kisses and your hugses and a set of Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs. How's that, Ah, uh, The spark of love. Why, sure. Everybody loves Autolite Wide Gap Resistor Spark Plugs. Replace your narrow gap plugs with these beauties to make your car idle smoother. Give better performance with leaner gas mixtures. Actually save gas dollars. Now, here's a Valentine that's right in line. Oh, Valentine, will you be mine, and will you make me happy? Put Autolite resistor spark plugs in my car, help make it smooth and snappy. Boy, that's hitting on all six. Well, naturally. Here's another Valentine that touches this old heart of mine. Oh, Autolite resistor spark plugs. With me, you are a fixture. You help my car run smoother far and go on lean gas mixture. I see. I know that's the best yet. Uh, but uh, right now, here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage Miss Jane Wyman as Margot in Catch Me If You Can. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I kept up my act all that day, and I didn't overplay it. I'm not the type for floods of tears, so I adopted a wan, gentle sadness, which made the others think me very brave. But all the time, there were two things on my mind, driving me crazy. Who was Rocky Rhodes? And where had Phil hidden the pills? And I couldn't hunt for them. Somebody was always in my room fussing over me. Finally, in the late afternoon, I managed to get away. I just started to look through Phil's clothes when... Oh, there you are. I was looking for you. No snowplow gets through here today. I just had to put up with Charlie Miller's jokes another evening. Are his jokes that bad? Well, you heard him ragging Susan, calling her Susie Q. Oh, nickname. Lots of people have the nickname habit. My husband had a friend named Rhodes. He nicknamed Rocky Rhodes. It's a change from Dusty Rhodes, at any rate. By the way, where are you from? Boston. Why do you ask? Oh, just idle curiosity. You know what they say about curiosity. Would you excuse me, please? I was going over my husband's thing. Yeah, go right ahead. I'll just uh, keep you company. Looking for something? Uh, no. I want to pack so I can leave as soon as possible. I want to get back to New York. I don't blame you. Need any help? No, thank you. As a matter of fact, I... Would you mind? I'd rather be alone. No, no, it's not good for you to be alone. I'll just stay in and keep you company. No, we'll see. Did you say something? No, I... Here's a book of Oscar Wilde. Now, why don't I read to you while you work? Let me see. Did your husband own all these shoes? He did. Wealthy man, apparently. How nice for you. Now, how about some poetry? Let's, uh, let's try this one. The poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. Shall I go on? But I couldn't let Sheldon unnerve me. I had to keep cool. I went on packing and he went on reading on and on endlessly about blood and prisons and hangings while I tried not to miss anything of Phil's. I had to have those pills. An hour later in my room, I knew I didn't have them. But Rocky Rhodes didn't have them yet either. Otherwise, he would have said something. But the pills didn't have to be in Phil's room. Which one was Rhodes? Miller or Sheldon? I would have to find out by elimination. After dinner that night, I went into the main parlor. And Charlie Miller grabbed me and danced me over to the fire. Ah, uh, here you are, Mrs. W. Now, you just sit right here and have a highball, see? And we'll have a nice little cozy chat with little old Charlie. Oh, you're so formal, Charlie. Call me Margo. Margo? I'll bet your mother called you Maggie. You thought up Margo to use on the stage. On the stage? How did you know I was an actress? 
this was the clue I've been looking for. Oh, a guy with my experience can always tell. You can? Sure. And I know how you actresses operate. You all take different monikers. I'll bet you were great, baby. Oh, I wasn't very good. There was only one way that Miller could have known about my being on the stage. From still. You weren't very good. Uh, I know different, baby. So what if you only played Tank Towns? I sure wish I'd seen you. You didn't miss much, really. Tank Towns? That was Phil's story, all right. Miller was Rocky Rhodes. And he was just drunk enough to handle. Good luck. How about you and me going up to my room where we can be alone? Huh? Oh, that wouldn't look right, Charlie. We could go out and sit in my car. It's in the garage. Got a heater? And radio. The hotel radio's broken. We can say that's why we're going, to listen to the music. Wonderful. Hey, you're a wonderful little woman, Maggie. Full of ideas. You fit. Okay. Right out of the bottle. Oh, oh boy, this is what I call living. Music, plenty of bourbon, and a beautiful blonde. Never saw such a beautiful blonde. Can I give Charlie a kiss? Oh, wow. Sweet as molasses. Get warm enough now, baby. Plenty warm. Could turn off that heater. I'm still a little cold, Charlie. Huh? Just stay close to me. In a minute, we'll turn it off. Then slowly, he sagged against me, and his head fell on my shoulder, and when I pushed him away, he fell forward against the steering wheel. I hope nobody heard that. Get out of here. Before it gets me too. Oh, I kept on my feet. Going around the car. I was dizzy, getting numb. And then a few feet from the garage door, I keeled over. For a minute or more, I could move. And then I to get there. I opened the door somehow, pushed it shut, and half fell out and lay in the snow. Breathing the clean air. Thanking my lucky stars I'd been smart enough not to drink. That's why it got Charlie sooner, because he was drunk. I looked at my watch and decided to wait 15 minutes. What a wonderful thing that carbon monoxide is. No smell, no nothing. It just creeps up on you. In 15 minutes, Charlie Miller, alias Rocky Rhodes, would be good and dead. He was dead, all right. When they found us, they carried me into the house and gave me a drink and put me to bed. I went right to sleep knowing Rocky Rhodes was dead. When I woke up, I remembered the car key. I had said Charlie started the car, but somebody might think to check the key for fingerprints and find mine. Oh, I put on a fur coat over my nightgown and ran all the way to the garage. I got in the car, reached for the keys, and they weren't there. Why? Why would anybody take my keys? And who would take them? Rocky Rhodes? No. He was dead. But was he? Had I killed the wrong man? I don't know how I ever got through breakfast. That's too bad about Charlie, Margot. Stop worrying about it. It wasn't your fault. You look tired. You want to take a walk? Get some fresh air? I I don't feel up to it. I was planning to go up to that lookout cabin on the peak. No, no, no. I'm too lazy for that. I mean a short walk. Is it a long climb, Mrs. Weatherby? Long and steep, believe me. I only made it up there once. But my husband used to go there often. I guess a good climb will do me good. I think I'll try it alone. Bye. I'll be back before dark. Bye. 
Be careful, Susan. I didn't even hear her leave. I was thinking about Phil's walk to the lookout cabin. There was where he'd hidden the pills. I knew it. I knew it in my bones. Why hadn't I thought of it before? Oh, I'd have to hurry. I couldn't let anyone find those pills except me. I managed to get away from the men and slipped out by the back door without being seen. A ladder goes up from the trail to the lookout door. The door of the cabin stood open. I climbed the ladder quietly and stepped in and saw Susan on the other side of the room near the door to the balcony. She was holding an envelope attached to a card, and she was reading the card. And suddenly, definitely, I knew. Miss Rocky Rose, I presume. Oh, oh, you scared me, Mrs. Weatherby. I see you found what you're looking for. The pills my husband hid. You want to know if they're really poisonous? Oh, I, I read this card. Is it some kind of a joke? Oh, no, it's no joke. One of them would kill a man. But that's not what killed, killed Phil. I smothered him with a pillow. You didn't know that, did you? Oh, you shouldn't be telling me this. Phil told me you were coming, but I was expecting a man. I never dreamed Rocky Rhodes was a woman. Oh, you've mistaken me for someone else, really. Oh, come off it. You're already responsible for Charlie Miller's death, coming here under an assumed name. I killed him because I thought he was Rocky Rhodes. You Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, you're ill, Mrs. Weatherby. You're imagining. Stay where you are. You think you'll get out of here alive? I wouldn't go out that door if I were you. You'd step right off into blank space. But you can't do these things. They'll catch you. Who? How? Those pills are the only evidence against me. And I'll destroy them as soon as you're gone. Will you? Stop. Stay where you are. You fool. What good does that do you throwing them out? Watch where they fall. There. Right on the path. They'll stay there until I go down. But you've played your last card. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let go, Mrs. Weatherby. Let go. You're going over the edge, too. You're going to be another tragic accident. Let go of the table, you fool. <laughs> inch by inch, we're getting there. Now, out on the porch. I'll pull you over with me. Will you? Will you really? Oh, someone's coming. Someone's coming to trail. It's mine. You're crazy. No! No! Then a sharp pain. And I don't remember anymore until I woke up here in the snow and found you bending over me. Who are you? Where did you come from? I just came up from the village, Mrs. Weatherby. We know the whole story. The whole story? Now just take it easy, Mrs. Weatherby. Oh, I, I know. You must be a doctor. The doctor. They'll never hang me. No, Mrs. Weatherby. They'll never hang you. You're dying now. No. No, I can't die. After all I've had to do to live. Where did Mike go? I'm right here, Mrs. Weatherby. Like a vulture waiting for me to die. You're Rocky Road, aren't you, Mike? No, Mrs. Weatherby. You're lying. It has to be you. I killed Charlie and he wasn't Rocky Road. And Susan wasn't. You have to be. I I have to know. I have to kill Rocky or I've done it all for nothing. Rocky Rhodes mustn't find those poison pills. Your husband didn't die from poison, Mrs. Weatherby. So you would have been safe even if the pills were found. But, but, Ro Rocky Rhodes... None of those people was Rocky Rhodes. Your own guilt made you suspicious of everything they did. But there must be a Rocky Rhodes. Bill said there was. This has to be a lucky. Mm. Is she dead, Doctor? I'm afraid she is. And there I was being sorry for her, her husband being dead. Just think, she killed her husband and one of us, and none of us would ever have known it if she hadn't told Susan all about it in the cabin. 
It was good of you to get here so fast, Doctor. Well, I'd have gotten here sooner if it hadn't been for the blizzard. Maybe none of this would have happened. By the way, I'm not a doctor, Mr. Sheldon. My name is Rhodes. Rocky Rhodes. Thank you, Jane Wyman, for a splendid performance. Miss uh, Wyman, would you do me a favor? I'd be glad to, Mr. Wilcox. Would you autograph my script? <laughs> Why, certainly. What shall I write? Well, why not just write to A-L-R-S-P Wilcox from Jane Wyman. A-L-R-S-P? What does that stand for? Auto light resistor spark plugs. Oh, of course. I should have known. <laughs> a plug for plug. Why, sure. <laughs> well, A-L-R-S-P it is. There. How's that? Thank you. And did you know, Miss Wyman, that besides Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite makes over 400 other products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Autolite makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars, batteries, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors, all ignition engineered to meet the highest standards of leading automotive engineers. So, folks, tomorrow, treat your car to an expert motor tune-up. Visit your local Autolite service station listed in your classified telephone directory or the dealer who sells your make of car. And be sure to specify original factory parts. You're right with Autolite. And now, in introducing again our star, Miss Jane Wyman, I wish also to extend to her, on behalf of our sponsor and all of us here on Suspense, our sincere congratulations on her nomination for the Academy Award for her splendid performance in the current Warner Brothers picture, Johnny Belinda, and to wish her the best of luck in balloting. Thank you very much. And may I congratulate Suspense for being one of the top radio programs on the air. Truly radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Thank you, Miss Wyman. And I'll be listening next week when James Mason and his lovely wife, Pamela Kalino appear in the Agatha Christie story, Where There's a Will... Another gripping study in... Suspense! Tonight's suspense play was adapted by Sylvia Richards from the current best-selling mystery by Pat McGear. Music was composed by Lucian Morawick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. All light resistor spark plugs have been adopted as original factory equipment by six leading makes of cars and trucks. So, switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you James Mason and Pamela Colino in Agatha Christie's Where There's a Will. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leader. Friends, have you ever been in a dilemma? I mean, in a fix, like having to get started in a hurry and your motor won't turn over? Well, what you need is an Autolite Stay Full battery, that dandy dynamic battery you can definitely depend on. Why, by Cornelius, an Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. You can say bravura for that aqua pura. Plenty of extra liquid reserve. Yes, sirree. And it has extra plates in every cell. That means longer life and stronger life. What's more, those plates are protected against loss by fiberglass insulation. I can't say enough about Autolite Stay Full batteries, those marvelous marvels with more liquid reserve than Hollywood has stars. So get wise, get an Autolite Stay Full. Remember, you're right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents James Mason and Pamela Colino in A Tale Well Calculated to Keep You in Suspense. 
And now, Mr. Jepson, you really must let me make you a whiskey and soda. I have some excellent scotch. Never mind that, Ridgeway. I've come to find out when you can raise 10,000 pounds. I see. Yes, I see. <clears throat> well, Mr. Jepson, 10,000 pounds is a great deal of money. It's what's needed to cover your notes. Yes, that's right. But you know, Mr. Jepson, you might just let me write you one more IOU and try again. Your luck's run out, Bridgeway. Oh, well, I wasn't much of a gambler anyhow, was I? Perhaps it's just as well I've learned my lesson. How long, Mr. Jepson, would you say I have to raise the money? Four weeks. I see, four weeks. And if I should fail to raise the money? Hmm? I see. Well, you make yourself very clear, Mr. Jepson. But then perhaps all's not lost. Mrs. Harter, my aunt, has had the foresight to draw up a new will, making me her heir. The money was to go to her niece, my cousin Miriam, but now a new will's been drawn up. Aunt Mary finds me a much more satisfactory than poor Miriam. The very spirit of solicitude I am, forever inquiring about her health, about her poor weak heart. Uh, four weeks. Is that right, Mr. Jepson? That's right, Ridgeway. Or else. I see. Or else. That's when it began. That, plus the fortunate circumstance of the new will in my favor, decided me on my plan. Now, murder wouldn't look right. Nobody else living in the house but Aunt Mary and I, and Elizabeth, the maid. And since I would benefit by 40,000 pounds, no, murder would not look right. Besides, I was fond of Aunt Mary. Well, a day or so after Mr. Jepson's visit, there occurred to me a rather whimsical idea for a practical joke. The first thing was to determine the degree of weakness of Aunt Mary's weak heart. And so I arranged an appointment for her with Dr. Menel, the heart specialist in Harley Street. Just have a chair, Mr. Ridgway. Thank you, Dr. Menel. <clears throat> now, Mr. Ridgway, as you requested, I have gone over your aunt, Mrs. Harper, thoroughly. Yes. And there is a heart weakness. How dreadful. But not terribly serious, Charles, Dr. Manel says. But my poor dear Aunt Mary. Dear Charles. Uh, uh, naturally, you're shocked, Mr. Ridgway. But with the least care, she'll live to be 90, I should think. However, her mind must be kept well distracted. Mind distracted? Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Distraction for the mind and no sudden shocks. That's most important. No sudden shocks. I see. Well, thank you, Doctor. Not at all. Out uh, this way, my private exit. No use going through the waiting room again, eh? Well, good day, Mrs. Arthur. Uh, good day, Doctor. Goodbye, Doctor. Oh, I say, Vitry. Yes? I minimized your aunt's condition just a bit. Didn't want to alarm her. You, uh, understand. Yes, of course. But what I said about no shocks, no frights, most important. A good fright might very well carry her off. I see. I see. Well, uh, thank you, Doctor. <laughs> The next step was the radio. Aunt Mary must have a radio. But, Charles, you know I don't care for newfangled things. We've got on quite well without a t- t- wireless. I don't see why we should have one now. But don't you remember what Dr. Minnell said, Aunt Mary? The mind distracted, well distracted. Those were his very words. You know, I'm only thinking of your heart. I know you are, dear Charles. That's better, Aunt Mary. That's more like yourself. Mm, You are a comfort to me, Charles. (laughs) Thank you, Aunt Mary. Now, about the radio. But really, Charles... Now, 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 you really ought to trust my judgment. I'm a bit of an expert on radio, you know. Before the war, I even had a small sender station of my own. Some of the equipment's still in one of my boxes somewhere about. So, you see, I know. But the waves, Charles. The electric waves. They might have kept me. <laughs> There's no more electricity about it than there is about an electric light. Radio waves aren't electric. But, Charles, that... Well, I must say, it makes a frightful noise. We'll be tuned in a minute. Here we are. What is it? It's very What do you think of that? You can tune in the whole world. You see, Aunt Mary, radio waves converging from all over the world on this little box. From Madrid, Paris, New York, and beyond. Beyond! Who knows how far beyond? Well, I must say, Charles, you're quite poetic about it. Am I? Yes. 
Yes, I suppose I am. That was the first inkling I had that my little practical joke was going to be fun. The acting and coaxing poor dear Aunt Mary along bit by bit. Every evening she'd sit by the radio listening to the news on the BBC Home Service and the classical music on the third program. Then, one morning, I attached a wire into the radio while she was still in bed, ran it along under the carpet into the small anteroom of the sitting room where the radio stood, took the hand microphone left over from my amateur sending days and hooked it to the other end of the wire. And everything was all ready. That evening... I backed the car out of the garage and started off for my regular Wednesday evening of bridge. But I drove only a short way, then parked behind the hedge and walked back to the house. I let myself in the side door and went into the small room off the sitting room where Aunt Mary sat alone listening to the radio. It was the third program, a program of Beethoven. I opened the door the slightest crack. The moment had come. I felt my heart beating with strange emotion. I saw in my mind's eye Aunt Mary and the dimly lit sitting room, and I almost felt the mood she must have feeling as she sat dreamily immersed in the shifting strains of music. I picked up the microphone and... Mary! Can you hear me, Mary? This is Patrick. What? This is Patrick, your husband, speaking. From the other side. I am coming for you soon. Will you be ready, Mary? Patrick. Will you be ready, Mary? Patrick! <laughs> for suspense, Autolite is bringing you James Mason and Pamela Colino in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Uh, Hap, hmm? I spent Washington's birthday telling my young nephew the story of George Washington. What a great man he was. How he always told the truth. Well, it was nice to you, Harlow. This younger generation should know about George Washington. Yeah, and to illustrate, I told him how I always tell the truth about auto light stay full battery. Huh? Those marvelous, wonderful get-up-and-get batteries with the extra reserve of water. Why, son, I told him a camel is practically dehydrated compared to an auto light stay full battery. Because an Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. But, Harlow, you were telling your nephew about Always George... tell the truth, I told him. Like I tell the people about the punchy power for peppy performance packed in an Autolite Stay Full battery because of that ample sample of H2O. Yes, by Cornelius, I told him an Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. That extra liquid reserve means longer life and stronger life. I told him about the fiberglass insulation between plates that adds months to the life of an Autolite Stay Full battery. Now, I'm sure the kid learned a lot about George Washington. Uh, but wait, here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage James Mason, who will be joined by his wife, Pamela Colino, in Where There's a Will, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> After I'd spoken with the voice of Aunt Mary's dead husband, I waited a moment. Then, very cautiously, I looked into the sitting room. Aunt Mary was sitting bolt upright, transfixed. Then a sob broke from her as she looked toward the radio, which was now innocently transmitting the BBC third program again. I had to bite my lips to keep from laughing. But Aunt Mary said nothing about her experience. So I was obliged, the fourth morning after that, at breakfast... To say, casually. <clears throat> oh, I say, uh, Aunt Mary. Uh, yes, Charles? I was just wondering. Uh, last evening... Yes, Charles? Uh, Aunt Mary, who's that funny old boy up in the spare room? The picture, that is. You know, the picture over the mantelpiece, the old boy with the beaver and the side whiskers? Well, really, Charles, your tone is most disrespectful. I'm sorry. It's your Uncle Patrick, Charles. My late husband. Oh, I say, I'm sorry. I had no idea. After all, I never did know him, Aunt Mary. Very well, Charles. You see, I... I wondered. It was queer. Queer? What's queer? Are you trying to say something, Charles? Oh, no, 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 not really. It's nothing. Nothing that makes any sense, I mean. I wish you would tell me what it was that made you ask me about the picture of your uncle. Well, if you will have it, I fancied I saw him. Saw him? The man in the picture, I mean. Looking out of the end window when I was coming up the drive last night. What? Yeah. 
And later on, I happened to drift into the spare room, and there was the picture up over the mantelpiece, the same man. <sighs> it's all quite easy to explain, really, I expect, subconscious and all that. I must have noticed the picture before without realizing it, and then just fancied the face of the window. <sighs> oh, Mary, is something the matter? Charles, my husband's face. Did you see it in the end window? Why, yes. Why? Only that that was Patrick's. Your late uncle's dressing room, Charles. The very absurdity of the story I made poor Aunt Mary believe was the fun. The clever, roundabout way I played my role. The following Wednesday night, I pretended to play off, to go and play bridge again. I concealed myself in the room off the sitting room just as before, took up the microphone, and spoke from the other world in the same sepulchral tones. Mary, on Friday, I shall come for you. Friday at half past nine. At half past nine. Do not be afraid. There will be no pain. Be ready, Mary. When I came into her bedroom the next morning... Aunt Mary was speaking to Elizabeth in a most businesslike manner. Now, here you are, Elizabeth. I want you to take this letter I've written. Yes, ma'am. I wrote it last evening. If anything should happen, Friday evening. Uh, you understand me? Yes, ma'am. Friday evening? That's my night out. So it is, and you go right ahead. However, if anything shall have happened by the time you get back on Saturday, I want this letter delivered to Dr. Mayle. Yes, ma'am. Now, the top left-hand drawer of my bureau, it's locked. The long key with a white label. Everything in the drawer is ready. Ready, ma'am? For my burial. Oh, ma'am, why, what are you doing? I thought you were in a fight. Better help. No, oh, ma'am, ma that, Elizabeth. Don't be maudlin. Oh, ma'am. Elizabeth, did I ever tell you how much I've left you in my will? Oh, no, ma'am. Well, I can't seem to remember. It was 50 pounds in the old will, but did I raise it to 100? Well, at any rate, I want you to have 100 pounds. I'll have to look into it. But if anything should happen before I do, then Mr. Charles will see to it. Did I hear my name mentioned, dear Aunt Mary? Oh, good morning, Charles. Yes, I was just saying to Elizabeth, I don't know if I've left her 50 or 100 pounds. But if, any, but if anything should happen to me, it's to be 100 pounds. Well, I must say, that's a gloomy thing to be thinking about. Oh, Mr. Charles, does she think carrying on most awful just what now? This? That's enough, Elizabeth. You may go now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, now... Just what in the world is all this about? Suppose you tell me just what's going to happen to dear Aunt Mary. Charles, what do you plan to be doing Friday evening? Friday evening? Well, as a matter of fact, the Ewings asked me to go in and play bridge. But if you'd rather I stayed at home... No, no, Charles. Actually, I'd prefer to be alone. Well, just as you wish. You know, I think I'll have Mr. Hopkinson send me the will. I want to find out about the bequest to Elizabeth. It's either 50 or 100 pounds... The rest, dear Charles, of course, goes to you. Yes, dear Aunt Mary. Whatever you say. Friday evening. I picked that night because I knew it was Elizabeth's night off, and I wanted to be sure there was no one about. Friday evening, at eight o'clock, I drove away, waited for an hour to elapse, and then slipped back into the house. I looked through the crack in the door, and saw Aunt Mary sitting in the high back chair beside the radio. As I listened, the nine o'clock news ended and a program of music was about to begin. It was a quarter past nine. Fifteen minutes till the appointed time for the arrival of the dead Patrick. This time, I did not touch the microphone. I went upstairs, opened a camphor chest of old clothes in the spare room, took a tube of spirit gum from my pocket and bent forward intently in front of a mirror. Sharp on the instant of half past nine... There was a fumbling at the outer door of the house. And the front door slowly opened. And then there were slow, halting footsteps along the short hall to the sitting room where an old woman waited. And then the sitting room door opened. The time has come, Mary. Patrick. I'm ready. My practice.
practical joke had worked to perfection. Aunt Mary's poor old heart couldn't stand the strain of seeing her dead husband, Patrick, arrive in person to carry her off into the spirit world. I stepped over the body, which had fallen dangerously near the burning fire in the grate. I took the poker and thrust some folds of paper that were lying in the ash into the fire to bring up a blaze, and in the blaze burned the false beard and side whiskers. I detached the wire fixed into the radio and took wire and microphone upstairs. I undressed and replaced Uncle Patrick's old-fashioned suit of clothes in the camphor chest in the spare room where I'd found it. Then I dressed again and went off to play a bridge at the Ewings. Two days later. This is Mrs. Harper's... I mean, this was Mrs. Harper's residence. Oh, just a moment. It's Mr. Jepson, sir. All right, I'll take it. You may go, Elizabeth. Yes, sir. Ridgeway here. Anything wrong? Not yet. I just wanted you to know that I read about it in the Daily Standard, Ridgeway. <laughs> a pity about uh, poor dear Aunt Mary, don't you think, Mr. Jepson? A pity. And let me remind you, you have one week left. I haven't forgotten. Once the newspapers announce my inheritance of 40,000 pounds, I'll have no difficulty borrowing. And then I'll pay up. Good. Only remember this, Ridgeway. You don't pay up and I send you to the same place you sent to your Aunt Mary. Do you understand? Or maybe it wouldn't be quite the same place, Ridgeway. Now that you've got murder on your soul. Understand? <laughs> I understand, Mr. Jepson. And then, that evening, Dr. Manel came to the house. I really did think you'd want to see this. You say Elizabeth brought it to you? Yes. She said it was uh, one of Mrs. Harter's last requests that she do so. As a matter of fact, I do seem to remember... Yes, and I do recall seeing her give Elizabeth some such envelope as that. You've read the contents? That's what's queer. Here. Suppose you have a look for yourself. All right. Tonight, Wednesday, at 9.15, I have distinctly heard... The voice of my dead husband. He told me that he would come for me on Friday night at 9.30. If I should die on that day and at that hour, I should like the facts made known so as to prove beyond question the possibility of communicating with the spirit world. Mary Harter. What do you make of it? I... I hardly know. It's a coincidence, to say the least. She did die at nearly that very hour... 9.30 flight at night. But, uh, I, I don't understand. In the uh, circumstances, an autopsy is desirable, you uh, uh, understand. Purely as a matter of form. Yes. Yes, of course. Why not? Of course, everything must be done according to form. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Charles? Have you lost your sense of humor? Finally... Five days later. Mr. Hopkinson is here to see you, sir. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. That'll be all. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Ridgeway. Fightful morning. Uh, Mr. Hopkinson, <clears throat> about Mrs. Harter's, uh, my aunt's uh, will. <clears throat> I did not quite understand your insistent messages to me, Mr. Ridgeway. You seem to be under the impression the late Mrs. Harter's will was in our keeping. Why, well, yes. I've often heard my aunt say as much. Oh, quite, yeah. Uh, quite so. It was in our keeping. Was? That is what I said. Mrs. Harter wrote to us, however, asking that it be forwarded to her. There seemed to be some haste to the matter. At any rate, we got it out to her at once. She would have received it on Friday, the day of her death. I do seem to remember her making mention of it. Something about the bequest to Elizabeth. She wanted to check the amount. It must be about the house somewhere then. Elizabeth has been through Mrs. Harter's personal effects, I believe. Yes, just a moment. I'll call her. Elizabeth? Yes, Mr. Charles? Elizabeth, come here a moment, please. Yes, sir? Elizabeth, when you went through Mrs. Harter's things, was her will among them? No, sir. You're sure, Elizabeth? Yes, sir. You see, I know what it looked like. The poor mistress had it in her hand the very evening of her death when she sent me out. You're, you're sure of that? Oh, yes, sir. She pointed out that about the 50 pounds to me, sir. She said if she told you to give me the other 50 pounds. Not that I mentioned it to press you, No, sir. no, 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 of course not. The will was in a long blue envelope, sir. Quite right. The same blue envelope, Mr. Charles, sir was lying on the radio table by her chair the morning... the morning after, but empty, sir. It was the envelope in which I dispatched the will to your aunt, Mr. Ridgeway. Mr. Ridgeway, was there a fire in the grate on Friday evening? 
Yes, of course. I see. What are you driving at, Hopkinson? I'm afraid, Mr. Ridgway, only one conclusion is possible. Your aunt sent for her will in order to destroy it. What? Yes, Mr. Ridgway. But why? Why? <clears throat> you, uh, you had no disagreement with your aunt, Mr. Ridgway? Not at all. We, we were on the most affectionate terms right up to the end. <clears throat> of course. Quite. Mr. Ridgway, you will understand. Under the circumstances, we were obliged to investigate. Investigate? What do you mean? It happens that there is a former will of Mrs. Harter still extant. By it, Mrs. Harter leaves everything to her niece, uh, to your cousin, Miriam. To Miriam? Yes, but... As for the more recent will sent by me before her death to Mrs. Harter, it must have been burned in the grate. Burned? The will was burned. Mr. Charles, can I get you something? No. No, I'll be all right. Uh, you may go, Elizabeth. Yes. I'll run along, too, Mr. Ridgway. Uh, if there's nothing further... No, I'll, um, I'll telephone her. Uh, quite. And yet there would seem to be little use for that. We've notified your cousin Miriam of her inheritance. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised you didn't know all this yourself. You see, we sent word round to the press yesterday. Well, um, good day, Mr. Ridgway. Good day. I remembered some folds of paper that I thrust into the fire to make it blaze up and burn the false beard and side whiskers with which I'd frightened an old lady to death. And then I remembered something falling. A paper. A will. From an old woman's fingers as she stood frozen in terror too near the fire. I saw the fire again, consuming something. Consuming the will. <laughs> oh, my cleverness. <laughs> Your maid said you went in, but I thought she was lying. I don't like liars, Ridgway. Mr. Jepson, I... I read the papers. I read who's going to inherit your aunt's money. I don't like liars. But I did think I was going to inherit, or... Or, or why would I have killed her? You killed her? Of course. Oh, so you did kill her. How many times do you want me to say it? I believe that'll do. All right, Inspector. That's what I wanted you to hear. Come in. What? And bring in the maid, too. That was very clever of you, Mr. Jepson. I must confess, I had my doubts. Now, Mr. Ridgway, you'd better come along. <laughs> I was only joking, yeah. woman. Yes, sir. You heard Mr. Ridgway say he killed his aunt? I did, sir, but he must have been joking. He Never was... mind, that's enough. By the way, Mr. Ridgway, you'll be interested in knowing, I'm sure, that we checked with Dr. Manell on the autopsy. According to his report, your aunt's heart was so weak... She could not have lived another month. Oh. <laughs> what? what are you laughing at? That's your joke, old man. Oh, your joke. Yes. <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? Very funny. <laughs> Thank you, James Mason and Pamela Colino, for a splendid performance. Now, Harlow Wilcox. Friends, Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. And they're made by Autolite men who make over 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Yes, sirree, Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Now, here again is James Mason and wife... Pamela Colino. I hope you both enjoyed being on suspense tonight, and especially you, Mrs. Mason, even though the part of Elizabeth was small. Oh, yes, it was a lot of fun. You see, James and I learned a long time ago that it's not how large the part is, but how much fun you have playing it. Besides, next time, Tony Leader has promised to find a script for me, in which James can play a butler or a cat or something. <laughs> how about that, Mrs. Mason? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. And we're looking forward, too, to next week when 
Joan Fontaine will star in The Lovebirds, another gripping study in... Suspense. James Mason and Pamela Colino have just completed the book, The Cats in Our Lives. Tonight's suspense play was adapted from the Agatha Christie story by William Fifield. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Now here is great news. Beginning March 1st, suspense on television may be seen in many areas of the country, Tuesdays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Buy Autolite electrical parts, Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stayful batteries at your neighborhood Autolite dealer. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>